It's all good. It's all good. It's like a concert, right? When you're waiting to start and the band to jump on. And... All right. I think we're good. I think we are live now. Live on the Metal Voice today. The 20th of December. Hold on. All the time. Oh, there we go. I got an ad running here in the background. Oh, man. What a day today. We got Razor Razor all around. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Dave Carlo. Guitarist. Main man of Razor. And yeah. A friend of the metal voice, the one and only YouTube's big personality, Razor Fist. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Now, what kind of, it's more of a personality <laughs> disorder, really, at this point. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> Godspeed, one and all, and thank you for having me on. I'm really looking forward to talking with Dave and hearing what's been going on in the Razor camp, because we got some good things and we've had some struggles. Yes. Yeah. So and yeah. I just want to just plug uh, Mr. Razorfist there. You know, if you don't know him, you know, he does gaming. He does music reviews. He does bands, retrospectives, political commentary, and all with a nice twist. So, yeah, go check out his channel. It's a nice, pleasure nice to have Nice twist him back on. is uh, Canadian code for a generous peppering of dick jokes. <laughs> 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 Yes, there's always a, two Canadians, one American. There you go. All right. <laughs> L- let's start things off. Yes. Let's just start things off right off the bat. And, you know, uh, stage four cancer, your wife, uh, Dave, and the reason we're on today, you know, you know, Christmas, there's a lot of people talk about Christmas and giving and, you know, getting the message out. But this is the real Christmas. This is caring about others, especially in the metal community. We're here for each other. I know Razor Fist is here because this guy will always come come when you when the time is needed is always there for us. So Dave, tell us your story about your wife and your struggle right now. Okay. Well first And just to note everybody, we'll also talk about the new album by Razor later (laughs) on. Okay. But well well, let's 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 start with that for one second and let's just tell people that, you know, first of all, I uh, I am in the business of entertaining people. And that's what I want to go to my grave being known for. So this is a temporary situation we're addressing. Um, It's a huge importance to me and my family, obviously. But, um, you know, my intention with my YouTube channel and my social media and and with Razor is to entertain people. And that's what it will be long term. I'm not I don't want people, uh, you know, always associating me with tragedy. That's that's the thing. Now, I've had a lot of sucker punches. All right. And when I say I, I don't just mean me. I'm talking about me and my family, right? My son is autistic. My daughter has borderline personality disorder. If you read what that is, that's a pretty horrific thing to have. She's had three suicide attempts in the last five years. Uh, I talk about that on um, on the uh, GoFundMe page that we have, the fundraiser for my wife. I talk about it in my YouTube video. My channel is brand new. I haven't done much to promote it yet. Um, so this hopefully is an opportunity to do that. Right now, if you type Dave Carlo YouTube uh, uh, into Google, you get some guy who has four subscribers, okay? Um, and he's not me. And I think you guys can figure that out. <laughs> so maybe try, try uh, Dave Carlo Razor YouTube, and I think you'll find, you'll find me there, okay? I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not four subscribers. I've only had about 500. I just got it started, and we'll, we're going to build it up. Right. But uh, bottom line is we'll be yeah. lenient. Don't worry. It's okay. We get it. We all know what it's like. The first 500, right? right Razor yeah. fist. Oh my God. It took, <laughs> it took me like three years to get the 200. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, well, I mean, you're a long way from that now, which is congratulations on your success, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, but I'm glad yeah. you're jumping in. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the deal is, is that I want to be known as, as a person who entertains and that's my intention. Um, but I said, again, we've I've talked about it on my YouTube channel, talked about it in my uh, social media. Um, you know, we've had a lot of sucker punches. I started losing my eyesight when, in my early 30s. It's it's I have no central vision anymore. Um, so we have that issue. Uh, you know, that uh, this cost me a lot in my life, too. And then on top of that, I had cancer in 2012, which I beat. And, uh, you know, so the, the whole time we were going through all this shit and with my son and the autism and my daughter and her issues, I always thought, well, as long as Rose is okay, Rose is my wife, as long as Rose is okay, we, we, we can get past any of this stuff. So lo and behold, my wife gets cancer two months into this pandemic, and um, it's been a very tough situation for, for, for all of us. So because, first of all, 
it, it's hit us economically. And the reason it has, I mean, I've always prided myself on, on being able to, you know, I've done, I've done quite well in my life, to be honest with you. But after two years without any gigs, and then on top of that, you add the fact that my wife hasn't been able to work because of the cancer, and the pandemic was a bit of a sucker punch, but the, the, the cancer made it just impossible. So, like, you know, no income at all. And then you add the fact that um, the, uh, the situation is that I need extreme help to help Rose now because um, there's been a, a, a comedy of errors uh, by the, uh, the medical people up here. They really hung us out to dry. They, um, they treated Rose for a year with various chemos and everything. And then when the... Um, uh, the last chemo wasn't working, and I'm trying to summarize this quickly. Um, we, uh, you want more detail, I'll go to my YouTube channel. But what happened is, is they, um, she went almost, well, five months without any treatment because they were referring her to clinical trials that we kept trying to get into. And then at the last minute, they kept pulling the rug out from under us and telling us they were either full or she wasn't eligible. So they fucked us around from uh, August until now. Rose only had her first treatment in, in since August, just last week. She started a new, extremely aggressive, really aggressive, just about the type of chemo that almost kills you, but doesn't. Back it off a bit. And she's being directed also with the help of the Mayo Clinic now in uh, Minnesota. And that was something that I uh, reached out to them in October because I saw that what was happening up here was not good enough for Rose. There was just a lot of flippant, who gives a shit type of attitudes coming from the, uh, the doctors up here that were supposed to be helping her. And, um, you know, there are some really good doctors up here too. So I don't want to paint everybody with the same brush. But bottom line is, is that uh, the people that were in charge primarily with her care were more interested in their frickin' studies than they were in helping Rose. And that, unfortunately, didn't become crystal clear to us until it was pretty much too late. Meanwhile, she moved from stage two to stage four in cancer. And I think you guys, if you know anything about cancer, you know stage four is the final stage. It's the most uh, severe, and um, it's going to require like a, a, a tremendous effort to try and get her uh, to, reverse, to, to reverse what's been done. Um, it is doable, though. And uh, talking to the people at the Mayo Clinic, we've got a good regimen now that we're following. And uh, it's going to be tough, though. She's going to be feeling like shit for a good long time. And uh, it's going to be tough. But um, and then we have the economic issue. And that's why we did the fundraiser. And, you know, the people who have supported it at this point are fucking heroes to me. And I appreciate it greatly. And uh, believe me, I will find a way to give back to, to everybody in some way for your for your help. I really appreciate it. It means a ton to my family. It's also going to actually, uh, not that this is the only reason, but it's going to help me be able to fulfill my performing commitments in the coming year, because sometimes I may need some nursing help for Rose. And, um, you know, that's a financial, uh, you know, there's a cost involved in that. And uh, I'm going to need some help with that. Having that help will allow me to uh, leave if necessary to perform some shows. I don't want to be away from her for any prolonged length of time. But by all means, I need to uh, make sure she's looked after at all times. And I still want to play the shows that we booked for this year. That's important to me. Uh, and uh, this will help me fulfill those commitments. So, so Razorfist, do you have any uh, questions? Let's take this apart, this this whole... Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm just, like, blown away at how badly mismanaged that sounds. But it's, at the same time, I can completely understand going to the Mayo Clinic. I mean, people judging it, it seems like now everybody's judging everybody's medical choices or whatever but the truth is when you're dealing with life matters of life and death like this you know you you want to make sure that you're handling it exactly like you want to make sure every stone has been turned you yeah. know what i mean like you you want to make sure that you handle it but um i'm i'm really glad to hear that uh personally but at, at the same time so um when did you launch this fundraiser uh and and where exactly can everybody find it you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the link and I'm going to put it right in the chat for now. And then I'll yeah. put it in the description. But go ahead, Dave. I had seen, I had actually seen you give a, a like a brief kind of summary in one of the first couple of videos that you had done uh, on YouTube. Mm. But yeah, um, so so I kind of was apprised of this a little bit. And of course, uh, you know, jumped on the, the fundraiser there. But I want to make sure everybody else has access to it. Because, um, yeah, but, but you know, Dave, before you answer that, I want people to understand so Canada, we have we have a public health care 
And it's yeah. not a failure on that. It, it, and just so everybody understands, and people could bash it all they want, but we have really good public health care. What happened was Dave and his wife, and this is Dave told me, Dave and his wife signed up for, let's say, the first sessions or the, right? It was a trial. Is that what it was? Yeah, there was, there was three. And then when they waited, they go, you're going to have to wait five, six weeks to get the first trial. And then when they waited those five, six weeks, they told him, it's booked. Yeah. You got to yeah. wait for the next yeah. trial. Yeah. yeah. So, so then they waited for the next the trial. Right. It's, it's booked. Not, it's about, it's not about the system. The system can work, but it's about, it's about people in the system who are honestly being morons. Okay. Because um, you shouldn't be allowing as a doctor, you shouldn't be allowing uh, a patient who needs cancer treatment to go four and a half, five months without active treatment when they're in already in stage two. That's the and, problem right there. That's, that's yeah. what I'm getting at. So that's, that's the, the problem. problem. There is a cultural problem at Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto because that's where all the bullshit was. And it has to do with the fact that these people who are heading up these studies are more focused on statistics than they are on the people they're treating. They really don't give a shit about whether the person they're treating lives or dies. Now, somebody would challenge that on me. I'm sure they go, oh, that's wrong. Dave's totally wrong. Well, I'm going to tell you firsthand when I was trying to plead with these people to put some urgency behind this, that if somebody's life was at stake, I got answers that were just indifferent. Basically, they would just say, I know, okay? You but you don't, you understand what's happening here, right? My son and my daughter are gonna lose their mother and these are the issues they have and my mother and she, you know, I just try to get, give them a little bit of a human element so they understand that this is a, this isn't just uh, one person's life. And I'm, I know everybody's life is worth something, but let's be honest, if you're a 95 year old, um, grandmother and you're in a home, retirement home the impact of your death is not going to be the impact of the death of a person who's got the responsibilities and the things my my wife is doing so i try to explain to them this is a massive loss if we can't find a way to uh, to, to uh, save her um and bottom line is just this this indifference so the waiting basically caused stage two to stage four yeah yeah that waiting time there. They now, now this is where the Americans come in. That's where the American system sort of like you can prioritize, right? Raise your fist. I yeah, mean, I mean, yeah, there ain't no bullshit, right? And you, I well, and you hear, I, it's a little more open, I guess. But it's I, all I'm saying is like I, I'm I'm commiserating, I suppose, is just it's good to have that option there, you know, in case you want to kind of hit the gas pedal. But it costs, and and oh. uh, and I completely understand that, and that definitely brings us to where we are now, I suppose. I'm grateful. I, I'm grateful that the system, the American system is there and that it's available to us. OK, and let's be honest. Let's let's not uh, throw darts at any system. All right. Everybody's got their own systems. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I need to get this help. And the one thing the American system definitely offers that is better than the Canadian system is the sense of urgency and the, the, the how quick things can be done. And that's just the way it is and you know if that that offends anybody i'm sorry but that's what my, that's well, well i'm, I'm, I'm sort of like a i'm a, i'm, a, I'm a, i would say that it's great to have a public system it's great to have a private system in any society right for the people who can't afford it and the people who want that fast you know speedy uh, you know recovery or speedy surgery or whatever the case is yeah well sometimes it has to be fast right I mean, it has to be fast lives depend on it or or anything else another thing i might have to do is is go to the, the states for surgery on, on one of my hands too because I have um, I have a lot of gigs uh, coming up and I don't have a lot of time to be, um, you know, like the timing of it is uh, got to be it's got to be just right. Timed right so that I don't uh, lose a lot of time. Um, now, so he hence to Razor Fist's question, the fundraiser, this is yeah. why the money is needed. Yes. To get her on that fast track, yeah. get it done. Well, and the fact that the reason it's needed is because we don't have the money to do it on our own. I wish I did. I wish I did. But, uh, you know, one time I did, but it's it's going down, you know, like after two years of having to uh, live off of your savings. And then on top of that, um, I've had some big medical bills already to pay for, um, you know, uh, because uh, even in Canada, there were some things that Canadian government wasn't paying for that I had to pay for um, genetic al analysis of the tumor. So we could figure out the, uh, the DNA profile of the tumor, so to speak, to figure out the best way to fight did, it. Did, uh, did they declare you blind yet, Dave? No, they, no, no. Do you know I, this story, Razor Fist? Do you know this story? Yeah, yeah. He talked He's a little blind. bit about it in his video, but yeah, you, you have no. You're a peripheral visionary. You can I you can see far to the future, but only off to the side. In the words of Stephen Wright. 
But... Right. I look at I look I look directly at something I can't see it. But if I use my peripheral, I can see it. And after uh, how many years has it been? Twenty five years of this, I've become pretty good at using the corners of my eyes to do things. But it's still, you know, they're like I say, looking at you right now, for example, I can't actually see your face. But if I go like a godsend this, is what I call oh, that. <laughs> yeah. But if I look if I look above my iPad and just pick you up a little bit, now I can see the expression on your face. Um, I still can't read it perfectly, but I can now see that you that you're there. Um, yeah. it's just one of those things, right? I look right at the guitar when I'm playing. I can't actually see my hand, my left hand on the fretboard. I have to use my peripheral to do it. But I have some cool things I do too, right? Like I've got the uh uh, on my guitars here, if you can see it or not here, but I've got, uh, I have glow in the dark tape on my guitars and I hit it with um, ultraviolet light and uh, before I go on stage and it, it's actually, this, this tape is amazing. It holds, uh, it, it glows for a couple of hours. So that helps me in low light conditions on stage. So, unbelievable, uh, unbelievable. Wow. You know what? And, and, and the reason why I bring up the blindness, okay, or the partial blindness yeah. is because here's a man who loves his wife, who loves his family, is partially blind. The government doesn't help you in any way, form, right? With the blindness? No, because, I'm not on the. Yeah. Because you're not considered blind enough, right? No, I'm blind enough. I'm blind. I'm blind <laughs> it's I'm blind. crazy. Now, the man whose only means to make money is music, which he has a, he's got to put like stickers on his guitar to, to pull it off, which is amazing, can't get the money because he can't tour. He can't sell records, right? In the environment that we're in, right? He's got to take care of his wife. He can't work the normal job because of his partial blindness. So he's yeah. reaching out to the metal community. Right, Dave? And he doesn't yes. like this. And Dave told You're me on the phone, Jimmy, this is the last thing I ever wanted to do. Uh, it, it broke his heart. I'm raising his It broke his heart to, to have to go out and ask for money. That's the last thing Dave wanted to do. Yeah. It breaks my heart. Who wants to be known for that? It's embarrassing, right? And uh, like I say, um, Something we're going to do for people. Um, I've talked to some of the people who are helping me with this. And, uh, you know, um, I want to at least uh, people who donate a certain amount of money, I, I got to send them something. I got to send them something as a thank you. So that's that's being worked on right now. Um, and if you donated, uh, you know, from the very beginning, anybody who sent me a certain dollar amount, we're going to figure it out. We're going to send them something as a thank you. Just because um, I want them to have something. Probably going to be something like a um, like a patch or something with a, with a, a razor logo and fuck cancer under it, something like that. Uh, we're, we're talking about something like that. So, um, but we're going to do that. Yeah. Kick it ass. sucks. But I, I, I am, you know, like I said. And, and you know what, Razor Fist, if, if I'm just sort of over talking, feel free to interject anytime you want. You know, I'm oh, not no, here. I'm, okay. I'm totally fine with it. I'm, in, I'm a chronic and habitual interrupter. Anyways, so do not do not feel bad about it at all. Okay, all right, all right, all right. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be rude. And Dave, if I cut you off, I oh, just cut people it, off too. It's, it's just yeah, my man. thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm verbose as hell anyway, so it's okay. I can uh, I can use a br taking a breath once right. in a while. Uh, on, and, and okay, so there's a GoFundMe page I'm putting in the chat. I see there's a few donations by Kenny there. Kenny, if you if you give a donation right now, we'll read your name and maybe we'll just you know say something nice about you. Just uh, or Dave will well, say I something. Tell you, I'm very grateful to people who are helping us. Um, you know, like I say, if you uh, you got to spend a few minutes talking to my wife, now she's very private. She's always embarrassed about everything. And you know, I said, can I can I put a picture of you? She's like, no, no, I don't want to be. A, oh, that's you. my wife. I can yeah, find the was, nicest picture, she, she, and my wife will never let me put it on. No, no, I get cracked in the coconut if I tried. So, uh, right. bottom line is, is it's 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 enough that I was even able to just get her name out there, but. Um, yeah, she's, uh, you know, she's she's just a lovely person, man. She cares about everybody. She always puts everybody's interests ahead of her own. Um, you know, she's been, she's done so much for my my kids. And if you go to the GoFundMe page, if you have a few minutes, read what I wrote about her and what she's like. And, uh, you know, you can also get a feel for some of the stuff we've been through. Um, you know, it's enough, man. I've had enough soccer punches. And, and I'm hoping, I keep saying that every time I get a new one, I say, oh, I hope this is the last one. But, you know, life just is, I mean, for everybody, and I know that it's not just about us, but for everybody, life is a kick in the nuts after one after the other for, for a lot of people. But, uh, um, you know, we're getting, I think, too many kicks in the nuts right now. And they're with steel toed fucking shoes, too. So. <laughs> in Canada, we got a lot of those. Um, uh, so those people who don't want to use GoFundMe, there's also PayPal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put your email address in the chat. So I donated by PayPal on behalf of Razor Fist and the Metal Voice. So we sent you a donation yep. yes, and I'm going to encourage others. If you don't use GoFundMe, 
There's Dave's personal email specifically for PayPal. Just send him an email and he'll send you a link for PayPal right. and you can right, send a donation not, there. That's not my PayPal email address though. So no, no, like, no, no. Yes, yes. Action there. Reach out to me first. Uh, email me, and then I'll give you that information. I don't. I didn't. I, so that, that's not my PayPal address. So like, don't just do a transaction through PayPal to that address because that's not gonna. That's there's nothing there. There's nobody. It's okay. Yeah. Quality email. Condor said just donated. God bless you and you yours, Dave. Uh, Razor you. is a killer band, and you're my friend. You're a killer man. Godspeed. If you guys want to know exactly how killer they are, I did a whole episode on them. Refamiliarize yourself with their incredible work, because this is a band that, you know, all throughout mid to to late 80s into the early 90s and, you know, well into the 90s. It's been a long time since the last record, but still the body of work holds up and uh, an incredible pillar, not just of like the Canadian metal scene, but just of the thrash scene in general. If you like, if you always, if you liked the idea of thrash, but wanted that melodic kind of Judas Priest and a little bit of maybe Motorhead kind of thing going on that a lot of those bands lack, unfortunately, uh, Razor is incredible in that How's respect. This? How's this, uh, and you should, you should definitely uh, support them that way as well. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And, and, and by the way, Rebel Rocker, she donated 20 bucks. I'll send that 20. It came to me, but I'll send it to you, Dave. All okay. right. Thanks, Jimmy. All right. all right, I will. Thank you, and, Rebel. Uh, and, and to Razor Fist's point, all right, so. Oh, yeah. Just just a little bit of, uh, and Dave, I'm not sure if you can see this. These are all your albums that I've purchased. Yeah, they were reissued today. not long ago. What, like 2016 or something? Yep. Yeah. I've got a uh, I've got a good relationship with the the my my friends over at Relapse Records. They're awesome. Uh, they've been uh, they've been so supportive of the band and so good to me and so you know just awesome to work with. And uh, they will also be doing the new album. Um, and I also have a record label called High Roller Records over in Germany that that does a lot of my vinyl stuff. And they're they're just great allies and friends of mine too. Uh, those are my two biggest partners. Um, and I also have another partner I should mention is, is Rockstack in, uh, in Japan, in Osaka, Japan. Um, they're also a really important partner for us. But, but really, on this new album, Relapse is in the driver's seat on getting this one out. They've got the, uh, they've got the rights to, to do the, the full worldwide uh, release in all formats. And I know they're going to do every format. They're even going to be doing a cassette version of this. So, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, which for me, you know, being as ancient as I am, you know, I can't believe cassettes are coming back, but they, they, you know, so people want cassettes. So they have, you don't think cassettes do have their own sound. I have to say they do. It's kind of a muffled sort of uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, there's a charm to it. Believe it or not. There is. Yeah. It's this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, hey man, it's the nostalgia for people too. And it's like, they want to, they, they want to go through what we went through it. Right? Okay. Let's we're going back to 1983 and we're going to get the new album. We're going to put it on, we're going to put it on, on tape and everything sounds like, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm thinking that we're going to fall, stop short with eight track tapes, though. I don't think we're going that far back. <laughs> it never really took off. Damn it. I was planning to my release dad. my next album you know, on was... Wax Cylinder. I was going <laughs> to, damn it. Or View, what about Viewmaster? Um, we got two, we got two, uh, uh, I owned, I actually owned two albums on eight track, which tells you how old I am. I owned ACDC <laughs> Highway to Hell on eight track, and I owned, um, well, I got this one because I bought it for like a dollar in a delete bin. Deep Purple, Come Taste the Band. I got oh. that for a, and, you know, there's some, good on it. there's some good songs on it. This is, yo, uh, it's a great album. Are you kidding me? Jesus, I love <laughs> I love Mark, uh, Mark III, uh, Deep Purple. But that's yeah. awesome on 8-Track. Yeah. That is an album made for 8-Track, by the way. It's awfully funky. I'm just saying. Yes. <laughs> it's yes, very it much an 8-Track album. <laughs> Interestingly <laughs> enough, that record, I don't think when I had that one, um, the ACDC one was really, what they did was, unbelievable they took the third song on it which is walk all over you and they faded it out when the, there, there's four program four channels on the eight track four tracks and because they only had so much room on each spot they actually fade the song out and then when it, you hear it click and it fades back in and it's like holy shit that's just unbelievable it just feels like who would want to listen to a song that way you know right you know, you know eight track is funny because when you want to when you press the change the song it just goes halfway to the next song or the third yeah. song there's no real start at the beginning and start end at the end it's just it's just all over the map man my father yeah. had my father had one of those a track cassette um 
you know, it's sort of like it was an eight track. What's the right word? You put it into the eight track machine, but you then you yeah. could put your cassette inside of it so you could play your cassettes oh, yeah, yeah, on the yeah, stage. Yeah. Right. I know what that is. Yeah, like, like I know what you're talking about. I had one of those with, for CD when they first the CDs first came out. For it was a cassette that you put bizarre. in. Bizarre. Yes, a bizarre. You could play inside your eight track this mechanism, yeah. right? Yeah. Inside. We are, just, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are. We I, I almost called you ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen. <laughs> I, I think we are carbon dating ourselves. <laughs> yeah. No question. No question. Dave. I have to cut decibels. us in half and count the rings, I think. Dave, decibels. <laughs> I mean, yep. uh, this album, is is it even out? Like, is it, have they, have they redone decibels it, is, reissued? Decibels is, uh, yeah, decibels is, uh, is only available, um, really, I think, for the world, it would be an online thing. Um, there was a vinyl version of it in Europe that we did a few years back. Um, I haven't actively pushed trying to get that licensed um, too much. Um, I, Canada has, uh, it's, it's Linus Entertainment in Canada that does it. And uh, yeah, I haven't really uh, made any, uh, any deals to release that one worldwide um, at this point. Kind of uh, the, 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 the arrangement, the recording arrangement I had on that record is just, uh, you know, I have to get some legal stuff checked out before I would do that. That's all. It's not that I. It's not that I'd be breaking any uh, any rights or anything. I own all the publishing and all, all the versions of the songs and everything. But um, distribution agreement was a little foggy, so I just have to make sure that if I, before I do any licenses, that I have my lawyer look at it. But for the record, if anyone wants to listen to it, it's, it's on Spotify, I believe. I've seen it on there. Oh yeah, you can hear it. It's on Spotify. It's on Amazon Music. Um, I think you gotta have the premium to get it. But uh, it's uh, it's also uh, you know it is or you can buy it on Amazon. Amazon.com, Amazon.ca in Canada, they have uh, decibels can be bought as a CD. So yeah, it's a yeah. it's a little different approach to Razor, but there's some great stuff on it that I really really well, like. I agree. You know, I, agree. You listen, I don't know if you uh, like. There's a demo on the internet. I don't know how somebody got a hold of this. They uploaded it, and um, it was a demo for that album. And what happened was, the, I the temp it was in not like that album was written in 1992, not 1997 when it came out. It was written as the follow-up to Open Hostility, and tempo-wise, it was it was a lot faster. And there is a demo of it up on the internet where it's being played a lot faster. Um, that intention, but five years later, yeah, you think you're breaking up? Slight yeah. internet issues. Somebody, do it. somebody in your house okay. must be using the but internet. But bottom line is, is that <laughs> who's out? You're good Where, now, Dave. You had some internet there issues there for a minute, but uh, if you want to recap the last couple of seconds of what you were saying, I'd like to I'd like to crack Rogers in the coconut because I pay a fortune for my internet. It should be pristine <laughs> all the time. Oh my god, I, I pay the, like you wouldn't believe the, how much money I pay those fuckers for my internet. All right, it better be it better not have any hiccups. Anyway, right. yeah, going back to what I was saying, you know, the, the, the Rogers here fucking ruined my train of thought. Um, <laughs> what was I talking about? Decibels, right? Yes. About, yeah okay um, you were saying there was a version that was uh leaked out of the internet of course some guy got it via telepathy or something because right. that's just how it works and uh and put it online and it's a lot faster because it was originally written in 92 right after open hostility which is like jesus christ it's like a hummingbird on crystal meth that that right. record it's super it's probably the fastest record you guys ever did open hostility it, it is it averages about 230 beats a minute the, uh, <laughs> the, yeah, it's pretty fast. Um, it, yeah, and the thing is, uh, also, is. Um, great yeah. record, great record. So, so decibels was, I think, in in the faster form, much much stronger, uh, much better. And also, we t we tuned down extremely for decibels, which was uh, more than we ever did. We were really low, and um, I think maybe for thrash, I've learned um, that you know, as I get older, I start to realize what I, what I should have done. Should have been tuned up a little more. It would have made it a little crisper, a little a little more uh, dynamic sounding, I think. So that stuff. Plus, and I don't. I'm not taking a shot at Bob. I, I, I Bob read it all. I love Bob, but um, you know he wrote all the lyrics on decibels because I wasn't at that time particularly interested uh, in in that. I wasn't really thinking about it. I, I didn't think anybody cared about thrash anymore when we did that record. So I kind of did it a little tongue in cheek. So I let him write all the lyrics. Um, so it's missing some of that element of the way I write lyrics, which is more of the, you know, uh, the revenge kind of, uh, it, you know, uh, that Charles Bronson kind of mentality. That yes. Comes my <laughs> lyrics, right? <laughs> there wasn't any of that on decibels. So yeah. uh, maybe it was. Still a great album. Still a great album. I dig it. 
It is. No, and I actually, I have to say, I would I would actually compliment some of the lyrics. They're pretty good, actually. Uh, Jimmy yeah, Bob's a, good, Bob's a good lyricist. Just uh, sometimes, you know what would bother me about it was I, I, I told Bob, he said, Bob, for fuck's sakes, you've got a song on there called Liar. You've got a song on there called The Game. Is this a Queen album? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, can we come up with some original uh, uh, song titles here? You know, nice. just stuff oh. like that. Okay, fine. And now I'm going to go write Bicycle Race. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. He's like, I won't show you the new one I wrote here, Fat Bottom Girls. You, don't want yes. you know what I mean? Ironically, <laughs> would probably work as a thrash song. Yeah. <laughs> Great song. All right, guys. So Frederick gave 20 bucks. Jacob gave 20 bucks, 25 bucks. Anonymous gave 40 bucks. Kenny gave 25 bucks, like I mentioned. That happened in the last Thank 17 so minutes, and I'm hoping. Hey, we got my buddy Todd Latori. All the best to you and your family. If we can only get one dollar from each Metal Voice subscriber, the financial goal will have been met and exceeded. Todd, buddy, thank you for uh, jumping on. Um, and uh, and if the Razor Todd. Force can check in, I'm sure we can push that over the line. I'm sure we can uh, get that. That would be such so so helpful. So it would be just lovely. It would be really yeah. Uh, to make my wife cry, but you know, <laughs> it's okay. Crying's good. She what she doesn't cry easy she's a tough lady she's a tough lady but yeah, you know well she, she would have to be with some of the stuff you guys have put up with in the last uh, seven years i mean for crying out loud just being married i, I couldn't deal with it you know what's funny i'll tell you a quick story here malicious intent i actually i bought this a while oh, back good stuff great album great album and and i bought it twice by mistake do you ever do that <laughs> Are I've you ta that. you're talking to me? I bought I bought an Xbox Series X twice on accident. You, that's no. a, that's an expensive mistake. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. okay, this was an expensive. You know, I, I bought it twice. Like you go, do yeah. I have this? Do I have this? And I bought I it. I realized, shit, I got it. So yeah. All right, Elder well, Chicken you know, gave you twenty you bucks. Me, I would have happily sent you one, Jimmy. But of course, that one there, that malicious intent, is controlled by those uh, those Unidisc people. And they're oh, not, you know, they're not boy. my favorites. So they're not my favorites. They're, they are number one front and center. The reason why my first three records are so hard to get worldwide. Yeah. They, they've made it so hard. And uh, what about Jeff Waters? Know, Jeff Waters, didn't he have a hand in helping you? Or was that with Exciter? I don't remember. Uh, From Annihilator. Jeff, no, Jeff Waters is a friend, but I don't think he's uh, helped me with anything. No, I mean. He joined me on stage once. We played together, but that's about it. I don't think okay. uh, it was Exciter that he did the reissue. Yeah, see, for that. J Jimmy's Canadian bands are blurring together now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Jeff's in England now. Jeff's over in England. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yeah. Uh, Michael Greenwood donated a hundred bucks. So there you go. In the last five minutes, I'm hoping Thank it you, was brother. because of this. Right. Thank so, you so much, brother. I'm not. Do you know him? No, but he's my brother now. He just donated yeah. 100. <laughs> Todd Latori from Queens, right? Says all the best to you and your family, Dave. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. I'm going to convey all this to my wife, too. Yes, please do. You're going to upload this later, right, Jimmy? Uh, it's going to be up on your channel, probably, right? Buddy, so this is uploaded right now as it's we're archiving. Talking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's archiving, and you can rewatch it. Like, you know, you watch The Simpsons on reruns, you know, it's uh, yeah. it's there, it's there. I'm going to have to get you guys to teach me some of what you guys do, uh, because I, I'm trying to find a way to, um, you know, like, I'm I'm a neophyte, man. I'm so I'm so inexperienced at this uh, stuff with YouTube and, and uh, social media in general, I'm, I'm not good at. And I, I just, uh, I don't know, man, I give you some pointers. It's, yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it's hard, man, how's I, that? I, it's really I hear hard. you. <laughs> And I'm a total boomer when it comes to this stuff. Like it's not even it's not even funny. So I'm I'm way behind. I'm with you. Okay. Well, I got to tell you, it's not easy, Dave. And there's a lot of people who have YouTube shows and YouTube channels. And after a year or two, they realize I'm going nowhere, or it's just too much work to keep it up. It's tough. It's not easy. There's always going to be those one or two YouTube channels that just take off. Because at the right place at the right time, just like anything in life, you know, you open up a restaurant, two yeah. restaurants, one guy is just getting all the business, the other guy isn't, it's identical food, but it's just, that's life, you know, there'll always yeah. be those people who are so lucky to get the right thing at the right time, at the right place, and just. That's successful. why you got to be in it for you, your own fulfillment. Because well, if, right? if that's if that's what you're digging, then yep. having people watching or not is not really going to matter. You know what that's I mean? That's how I look at it. I'm totally like that, actually. I, I'm not that worried about 
uh, how many people are on board. I'm more interested in, I just want to have a way of connecting with the people that, that like my music and are interested in the band and things like that. So, um, and sometimes I'll, I'll do some stuff that's not related to music too. I might offer an opinion on, on, on you know, the odd thing here and there. Um, haven't really done much of that yet. Um, but right now there's a lot to, to talk about with the band. When we get this thing rolling, we get this freaking, um, uh, you know, get the record out and get us out playing. And, you know, this pandemic, we get this tamed a little bit so we can, uh, so we can go out and play some shows without worrying too much, you know? And yeah. uh, Todd Latour, if you want to jump on the show, I'll send you a link and say hi. If you're busy, it's all good, man. Um, Elder Chicken, I'm not sure if I mentioned this. Elder Chicken gave you 20 bucks, but he gave it to me. I'll give it to you. So I'll, I owe you 40 bucks now, Dave. Cool. Okay. Okay. Elder awesome. Chicken. Elder um, Chicken. Briefly, you, you've talked about this a little bit on videos on your YouTube channel. For those who might just be joining us and not be aware of those, you've talked a little bit about the sonic character of the next album. It's a little... I, I think you mentioned violent restitution a little bit and stuff, uh, which is one of my favorites. So talk to me like about how it kind of shaped up. Okay, well, the last, the, the album, I think the last video I called it a beast, right? This album's a beast. And what I mean by that is, okay, I will tell you this. This album has my fingerprints all over it, okay? I am prepared to live or die by this record in terms of I am micromanaging the process. So if you don't like this record, then you don't like what I'm, uh, I'm offering, okay? And you can blame me for this one. Because um, in the past, I may have said, oh, you know, I didn't have any control on this one or I didn't do this one. This one I'm controlling 100%, like I did with Violent Restitution. Um, so that's, that's where there's a similarity. Um, and as far as the material goes, um, of course, I always write to please myself first because I figure that's got to be what you do because if you don't do anything else, it's not going to be genuine. So I, I please myself first. And if somebody else says, well, it's not my cup of tea, I'm like, well, it's not your cup of tea, but it was mine so that you know, I'm happy. I can listen to it in 10 years and I'm going to still be happy with what I did. So this album is, I will tell you right off the bat, it's an ass kicking album. It's fast as fuck. It's violent as fuck. It's heavy as fuck. Um, this is my opinion. Uh, I'll give you the track listing. I haven't been told I can't do that. So there's 12 songs. Uh, side one, okay, now I have to remember, I'm getting old man here. Side one, the songs are called- Side one, like people, some kids are saying like, side one, what's that? Well, <laughs> Isn't there only one side? <laughs> no, well, dude, the kids, the dude, you don't even understand. We're we're so old now, yeah. the kids have actually lapped us. They're back to the side one and side two. Oh, it's two. true, you're They're right, back you're to right. the vinyl. That's this is true. Side vinyl. A, side D, yeah. We got vinyl like a set now. So side one and side two are now relevant again, which I like because it allows me to lay out the record the way I want. Because you actually, when you're st structuring the, the, the song running order, there's impact points, right? And you want to think of those things when you make a running order. Like side one and side two have to kick off with, with dynamic ass kickers, right? Like they have to grab your attention. So anyway, so uh, we do have a side one and a side two, and there's, uh, there's uh, 12 songs on the album. And uh, so side one, uh, the song titles are, so the first song is called Flames of Hatred. The second song is called Jabroni. It's a wrestling term. Yes! <laughs> Believe me, you're yes! going to Yes! One that of my favorite great, words. This song will be a great theme song for a wrestler if he wants to play something, enter in the ring. Uh, next song is called Off My Meds. That's the third song. The fourth song is called A Bitter Pill. That's the one I teased on one of my videos. The fifth song is called Crossed. You know what that's about, obviously. The sixth one is called uh, um, First Rate Hate. That's side one, okay? The so side two is the title track, Cycle of Contempt. Uh, the next song is called Set Up. Uh, the third song is called Punch Your Face In. The fourth song is called Fist Fighting. The fifth, <laughs> song, is called, the fifth song is called Darkness Falls. And the last song is called King Shit, which is about a fucking, uh, like a, a fucking slumlord. So I love it. <laughs> that is the new it sounds like the soundtrack to Death Wish 7. I love it's it. A, it's, it's, <laughs> oh, guys, okay. I, I, if I interrupt everyone, it's because somebody donated money. So Rabbit yes. donated 50 bucks. So there you go, Dave. Rabbit donated Thanks. $50. So right now I owe you 56, 80 bucks. Okay, Am I counting cool. right? 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 90 bucks. So there's uh, two 20s. Uh, I see Elder Chicken with a 20, Rebel Rocker with a 20, 50, 60, 70. I owe you 90 bucks, okay? So thanks, Jimmy. Hold me to that, Dave. Hold me to that. Okay. I'm, I'm good for my word. I'm good for my word. 
They're like, where, where the hell's my money, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, so uh, all right. Yeah. But describe the musical direction. Okay, you said it's fast, it's furious. I mean, maybe you give us a little more than that. Yeah. I Are mean, there any uh, ballads? Well, you know what I will say is I'm not going to like. I think I may have said uh, I was comparing it to Violent Restitution because of the level of control I put on the record. But realistically, it's its own thing for for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Like we're we're older now, and our playing is a little more sophisticated, I guess. Um, you know, um, but. I made it a purpose. It was it was important to me not to deviate from what I know people want from us. I like to give people what they want. I mean, I remember growing up uh, listening to ACDC, which was a band I was really into uh, in, the, in the 70s when they first came out. Um, every time a new ACDC album came out, it was fantastic to me. Like this is, I'm talking about the period between their, their, their inception and the last great ACDC album for my money, which was Fly on the Wall, 1985. Um, but that period is just great albums. Like, I mean, great, like flawless. There's not really a bad track to be found. Now, after that, I kind of feel like ACDC were so successful, they maybe mailed it in a bit, and they just didn't have the same level of motivation uh, uh, to make a quality all the way through record, because they were just getting too... It's hard when you have that kind of success. It's hard to get that worked up about it. So. Um, yeah, but that's their classic period. And I just remember how, when every album came out, how happy I was that they delivered the goods. So that's what I want to do. I want to do the same thing. I want people to anticipate a great album, and then I want them to get one. That's really important to me. It's a little punky, speed metal, thrash. I mean, is it oh, borderline thrash? Um, it's, it's definitely going to be... Uh, uh, um, it's high speed. It's high speed thrash metal. There's, there's guitar solos in... You know, the, the songs will get destructed with guitar solos. But the thing about me is, you know, we understand about Razor is, and this is not a knock on any other band at all. It's just the way we fit into the, the scene. No, 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 make it a knock on every other oh. band. Please do. <laughs> well, you know, Razor writes, <laughs> Razor writes songs, okay? And what right. I see that is, what I mean is, we use a structure that we'll go, you know, like we'll have a, a verse, a bridge, and a chorus. And then, you know, it's structured like that. Oh, I've noticed a lot of bands now do this thing um, and again, I'm not, I'm not criticizing it. It's not really my favorite thing, but that so it is somebody else's or it wouldn't be happening. They take you on a journey and it's like a journey. So it's like progressive. Exactly. Right. They go like songs are like six, seven minutes long and, and they're, they're, there's a roller coaster. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's are we talking about Sinjutsu oh, here? What are we talking about? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's double bass. It's, it's over the top. But it's like it's like just so much variety in one song. And it's like, holy fuck. Right. And we're not really like that. We're like, okay, this is what you, you know, this is what we do. So when people criticize my band, they say, oh, you know, I see Razor, but I think they're too samey to do that. Hey, man, there's a million other bands you can get what you're looking for from, okay? So we don't have to be the same. We're, we are a, a, a niche kind of band that delivers high speed, pounding fast metal in your face all the time, pretty relentless. That's our thing. Other bands will take you on that journey. If you need names of bands that do that, I'll give you some names. You can go listen to, you know, but um, criticizing my band for not for not being progressive enough is, you know, yeah. like you're just not getting it. You're just no, just it. tell those people to take a journey off, a, you know, a long walk up a short cliff, essentially. Well, That's a journey. Yeah. Or well, maybe they I, just, I think, Dave, it's exactly what you said. Journey. It's, it's <laughs> if people are expecting like Metallica, you know, like Metallica ish. Right. That's not what you're listening to yeah. Razor for. You know, you're listening for a fast, furious, and in your face, you know, music. By Which way, is not to not to undersell the metal that's melody. Right, that's that's right. one of the great things about Razor is that well, there's that melodious aspect to the band that is still there. There's a yeah, song yeah. under there. For sure it is. And I would say like we are like like there is some Metallica that that is kind of our style, which is like the stuff like Metal Militia or uh, uh, songs like that are kind of up our alley, right? Like like yeah. when we're Metallica's firing on all cylinders, that groove is kind of what our groove is too. But it's it's more of that. It's not you know, like we're not... It's we're not, not Lulu, that's what you're saying. 32 yeah. flavors of Nick Weiser say, gave right. you 10 bucks. So Thank you. 32 Thank flavors you. of Nick Weiser, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, gave you 10 bucks. So now, Dave, this is getting very 100. expensive for me. I owe you 100 bucks. 100 bucks, 100 bucks. Hundred, a brownie, as we say in Canada. Cool, because cool. it's I brown. Didn't, I didn't even know we said that. Well, I say that. <laughs> well, American money is getting orange. It's all green. It's all green. I don't know. I can't understand the greenness of it all in American money. 
Well, it's not way in me. razor fists, way in, way in on that. <laughs> Have you ever seen Canadian money? It's colorful. Okay, a 50s red, a isn't brownie like, is 100. Isn't it plastic or something now? It is, because if you jump in a pool with your money, it ain't going to dissolve. Who's on it? I remember I had, an, I, I, had an ex, I, I had an ex who was from Calgary. She would complain about the money all the time. Who's on it that's really controversial now? I can't remember. Well, well, who's on it? You know, we don't even know who's on it. But the thing is, we go with <laughs> yeah, colors. I we can't. go with colors. We had a $5 bill, and I think it was Stephen Wright that said it was Gene Wilder on it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Five, five is blue, by the way. Five is blue. Yeah. yeah and we don't have one McDonald anymore. on it, is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But, well, you know, I think they're made out of space age polymers now. I don't know. What no, no, called. it's really cool. Yeah, it's it's plastic ish. And then we don't have dollar bills anymore. We have loonies. And then we have we don't have two dollar bills. We have toonies, right? So yeah. that's, that's well, it's like Europe, right? That's what Europe does. Europe has all that stuff too. Europe's Europe's uh, two euro coin. I think it looks like like our toonie. I mean, but the U.S. Uh, it's all green, man. It's all green. It's, I, yeah. I don't get it. I know for, we're all stuck in the 1800s. We, oh, we got to break out. We got to break out scales at the general store. It's like Jesus Christ. Still using ounces. Oh, right. <laughs> I'll trade you my mule. Hey, I'll tell you one thing. I'll take the American money any day over the Canadian. Yeah, money. yeah, that's First that's for money. sure. Yeah, it's like 30 percent <laughs> difference. Right. We were on par a few years back. That was like a shock. It comes and goes. It comes and goes. But most of the yeah. time, the Americans got the stronger dollar. But it comes and goes. And that's why my advice, don't forget, I studied economics. My advice would be that if you are seeing parity on the dollar of Canadian American, then you should start buying as many American dollars as you can at that time because it's going to be worth more. You're going to make some money there doing yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Good. So some good economic, economic sense there, Dave. Uh, economics. economics. What, what did you plan to do with economics? I'm just wondering. Uh, I got a bachelor's what? in I got a bachelor's of commerce too, by the way. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. You know what? What I did with economics was well, you know, for, my wife's an accountant too by trade, right? She's an accountant, so um, just uh, you know, uh, uh, I was you know, at one point I was thinking that might be a road I have to go down. Um, you know, that, that was some time ago now, but you know, like I say, unfortunately, the way it's been for us lately, we can't, we can't, we can't do anything. We can't make any money doing anything right now. Unfortunately, it's been uh, it's been uh, shitty, but. Uh, uh, that's hey, knowing about money is never a bad thing on this planet. You, you know what? I would say that most musicians should, and I mean this in the nicest way, most artists, <laughs> it's good to take a lot of business courses because it just, yeah, it, it just helps you. It's like running a little business in a sense, right? You want to know where the money's coming, where it's going, how you're going to spend it, how you're going to market yourself. It's all part of it, you know. It's being self sufficient, you know. It's there's nothing well, bad I always about that, thought that, you know. Another thing that's what they should be doing in schools and high schools, they spend a lot of time teaching you stuff that you never use in your life. Like, I yes. mean, you know, you don't really need to know that much about certain uh, aspects of uh, history and things like that. They should be teaching you about the stock market. They should be teaching you how it works. They should be teaching you about yeah. the economic system and stuff that you need to know how to, you know, some kids like my kids are now, you know, in their, like uh, my son is 20, uh, 22. And my daughter is uh, 20. Uh, mm -hmm. They, they, they could use, well, I taught them, but how do you use a bank account? How does a credit card work? How do you make sure you don't do something stupid with your credit card? Like, this is the stuff they could teach you in school that would be useful how do, stuff. How does a condom work? How does a condom work? Well, hey, that's pretty <laughs> freaking useful, too. That's pretty useful, too. But, I mean, you know, just stuff like people buy stuff with credit cards, and then they don't pay their bill off every month. Yes, and then they're I agree. Like, 20% interest. They're going to be broke forever, right? All right, John Ezekiel. He just gave you a hundred bucks, Joseph Scarpino. And if I butcher any names, I apologize. Gave you 50 bucks. So it's become, you, it's been a very profitable show here. And, you know, you're getting some bucks there. I, I'm really happy. Um, the most, as much as we can help. I mean, I'm, I'm shouting it out again on my social media. Yeah, right I, now, I, I appreciate your support. I, I really appreciate your support, Razor. I call you Razor because I don't know. I, I don't read. Well, either Mr. Fist or Razor. Whatever. <laughs> Mr. F hey, hey, Mr. Fist or whatever. You know, just go for it. <laughs> well, listen, your support is really awesome. Man. And I also noticed when I told you just before the pandemic started, I had some, I was getting really overwhelmed because so many people were coming at us with so many uh, uh, offers on to do stuff. This is right before the pandemic. And the pandemic, of course, ruined a lot of momentum. But um, I, I put a tweet out saying, "Hey man, I'm just I'm overwhelmed. I need I need uh, I need somebody to manage the band." 
And, um, you know, that's something we should talk about too, brother, because, um, you know, when you did that, uh, that piece you did on us, which I really was wonderfully uh, flattered by. A retrospective it, on Razor. Yes. Yeah, it's called yeah. Metal, Metal Mythos Razor. If you guys haven't seen it, um, it's, it's, it's it. still one of our popular uh, Metal Mythos episodes. I, really, I know a lot of people got into it through that. It meant a lot to me that you did that because you, you, did, you did certainly uh, introduce a lot of new people to the band too. Um, but the thing is, uh, you you went off on me on two points. One was, um, uh, which you are wont to do, I noticed, over the... <laughs> over, over no! Of the it's no! Laying it all on the table here. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, Poppycock! Yes, yes, of course. Of course. Um, so anyway, the one was about the, the refusal to get management. And what I wanted to do was address that, because this one is something that I get asked about a lot more now. Um, and I want to point out to somebody... Uh, I wanted management. I wanted it. And I know that you, you you found a video somewhere of me saying that I didn't want management or an interview somewhere, but I would, I would draw your attention to the fact that that interview took place in 1991 when I already knew I was retiring. The band was ending. So I wasn't going to be looking for a manager there. But the reason I answered the questions the way I answered them that way was because I did not want to tell people we couldn't get a manager. I, I did not feel that that was good for the band's image to admit to people, yeah. we can't get a fucking manager. Because in Canada, we couldn't. Okay, now we should have relocated to the States. We realized that when it was too late. When I say too late, I mean the scene was changing and the flavor of the month wasn't fresh anymore, which is really sad because it shouldn't be about trends. It should be about whether it's solid music or not. And you let, but, yeah. it, but that's how it was. Everybody was moving on. Yeah, by, by, the top, by that point, you needed to relocate to Germany. You know what I mean? Right. Like, <laughs> the, only place, the only place left was Europe that was still like, like supporting that kind of stuff. So bottom line is, and I decided to move on with my life at that point because I was like, okay, this isn't going to work out. But I was still, I wanted to end Razor a certain way because I wasn't happy with the response to Custom Killing. And I said, I'm going to leave a legacy of some powerful records behind before I shut this down. But I knew I was moving on. So I wasn't going to tell people I can't get a Canadian manager. We tried for six years, seven years to get a manager, and they all said we were too fucking heavy. And uh, they, you know, meanwhile, Slayer met Rick Rubin, Metallica met the guys Cliff Bernstein and Q. Bradley. Everybody else uh, uh, were able to make connections, um, and that leads me to the song "American Luck," where people think I'm bashing America, but that song is about Canada. That song is about Canada. Great song. Yeah, yeah, it, it <laughs> actually is if you read the that lyrics. Song is attacking the Canadian situation. And I know you found some footage of me saying Canadians. Jeez, are we got, we're correcting all kinds today. Look at it. <laughs> no, this is good. No, this is good because I planned, actually, he and I were planning to do, before yeah, we were, all this uh, happened, we were planning to do a uh, um, Metal Mythos Aftershock, which is this okay, good, where I do, good. where I interview people after the thing because. They, I know you're going to find this a shock, but like on the internet, uh, there's a lot of bullshit out there when you look yeah, stuff yeah, up. What? I don't know. What? This is kind of what? alarming. I'm slowly <laughs> learning this. But, you know, so stuff has to be corrected, whatever. I did one recently with, um, you know, regarding Wasp, did one with Ripper Owens recently of Judas Priest, you know, just to kind of correct the record and get the actual artist's perspective. So it's actually yeah. good that he's... Because you know, yeah, you know, this honestly, is stuff we would have talked about anyway, and probably will in the future on a yes, uh, after yeah. shock. Oh, well, guys, pause. So the brutalist just gave you twenty bucks, so now, Dave, I owe you one hundred and twenty dollars. What was his name again? The brutalist. I like brutalist. that. Brutalist. Do oh, you know that's brutalist? Like, that's like the pugilist. That's almost. That's yeah, close. close, but it's the brutalist. Okay. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, brutalist. I appreciate it. 20 bucks um, there. Let me just check and see if anybody donated on the page yet. What am Oh, Marek, Marek Boswijic, five bucks. You know, hey. look, I'm trying my best here. With apologies for the With phonetics. apologies, yes. And I'm going to, again, put the link for the GoFundMe there. And Thanks, I will, again, put your email address, but do not send any PayPal money to this email address. Just no, use just email this email me. address to contact Dave. Dave. Yeah, just contact him. Don't start sending money there. No. Just to contact Dave. <laughs> Hot typing action. I do want to. Hey, Dave, this. we're going to talk about Motorhead in a bit, but finish what you were saying. Hey, this is important. I want to mention this too: is that there, there's a lot of people who've emailed me over the last couple of weeks since we started the fundraiser. Um, 
And I want them to know everybody's going to get an answer. So please be patient with me. There's been a lot going on. I never forget when people contact me or do something to help me. I never forget. I have a great memory, terrible eyesight, and a great memory. I will. You will hear from me. So please just, just you know, I recognize what you guys are doing to help, and you will hear back from me. Now, I just want to finish my American Luck thing because that's important to me. Yeah. Um, what what happened was there was some footage that he put up, which was, hey, man, he did a great job. He was covering, like, when he did something, he also showed, put some proof up there that he's, you know, what, what are we saying, what he said. So in American Luck video, he found a video of me where I said, uh, the Canadian audiences were just a little bit smarter, uh, uh, and I made this comment. Now, I want to, when I just said before, I drew his attention to the fact that we did an interview in 1991 where I knew I was calling it a day with Razor. But two was, on this one, I was talking to an audience of about 50 people in, you know, somewhere in Canada. I don't know where it was, okay? I never knew about YouTube. I never knew that, I never knew that someday a guy with a quarter of a million subscribers was going to take my 50 person <laughs> somewhere in Canada video and go, hey, look what this fucking guy God. said. Guys, <laughs> look at him, look at him. Which is, you know, it's like you, and then you look at it, you go, oh, Jesus Christ. Now everything I said back in the 80s is going to be like, you know, if I was in America, I might have said, hey, man, you know, the fucking people in Canada don't get this. You know, what, what, you know who knows, right? You say stuff to get people having a good time and having, you know, you just say something. Uh, and, you know, I, I, but bottom line is, honestly, the song American Luck was written about Canada. And the reason I called it American Luck was I was trying to get America to pay some attention to Razor. And I thought, because at that time, we needed more uh, attention because uh, it was when Thrash was starting to head out. And I thought, OK, let's get America in a song title so I can get the American people to notice. That's, you know, because you know, if somebody wrote a song called Canadian Luck, the Canadians would be looking too, right? So I thought, yeah, OK, it doesn't let's work that way, though. OK, Wolf, <laughs> Wolf gave you five bucks. They just apologize. Yeah, yeah. Wolf <laughs> gave four ninety nine. So thank you, Wolf. Oh. The Gunslinger. Gave five bucks, so thank you very cool. much for that. All right, so, so now I uh, owe you 130 bucks. I'm not sure if that's Canadian or American at this point. I don't know. It's just, I'm going to have to put it in the middle somewhere. I have no idea. Oh, and he good. says, rest in peace. Wolf says, rest in peace, Lemmy. And that's what I want to talk about right now. It's an official. Oh, and the Gunslinger says, it's an unofficial Metal Mythos Aftershock Plus. We get my two favorite things, wrestling, Charles Bronson, Swing right. a whiskey for the right man. And oh, Arson Art, Arson Art, and I'm going to read his statement. Awesome music, you guys. You have put out there, and I hope your wife beats this awful shit and gets better. Awesome content from Razor Fist as well. Godspeed, everyone. That's twenty Godspeed bucks. Godspeed and so, thanks for helping. So we're up to 150. Hold on, there's one more. Oh, the gunslinger, another five. Those are a blue. Those are blue, by the way, the $5 bills. I'm not sure if that's Canadian or American, but whatever. Razor is the equivalent of Bret Hart, beloved within the wrestling and metal circles worldwide, but you never made that that the kind of money they deserve. That the Razor what? never made the money. Sorry, guys. Hey, if I'm I could little... make as much money as Bret Hart did, for Christ's sake. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> so there's there's some money coming at you. So now I owe you, I think, I don't know what I owe you anymore. It's about 150 bucks now. That's about it. I owe you about 150 right. bucks. That's, again, coming through YouTube. But you are getting on your, your GoFundMe page as well. Let me check. Okay. Just updating that. So um, Motorhead. Okay. So let me... Today is the anniversary of his death. Yeah, I just saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, they had to be a big influence on you guys, I imagine. They oh, opened yeah. for them. They oh, opened for Motorhead, yeah. right? Many times we opened for Motorhead. Yes, we did a whole bunch of shows with Motorhead. It was fantastic in '85 and '86. Um, yeah, we got we got opportunities to play with them a bunch of times. Um, mostly with the uh, the lineup with Wurzel and uh, Phil Campbell and. Um, um, oh, come on now, I, I'm getting old, right? The, the drummer, Phil Pete Campbell, Gill. Uh, uh, Pete Gill. Gill. Yeah, Phil exactly. Gill. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And God, yeah. he's just Those about guys. the only one living. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, who's, who's, who's Wurzel's dead? Uh, Phil's still alive. Phil's that's still it. alive. Phil Campbell's still alive. Yeah, I'm not sure if Pete, Pete is or not, but, um, but uh, yeah, and uh, I still remember, Lemmy told us at the first time we played with them, we opened for them, um, I think it was in uh, Montreal or Toronto, but anyway, 
he uh, came up after the show and he, he said, uh, you guys sound like the damned. Now, I don't, I've listened to the damned since then and I don't, I don't hear us sounding like the damned, but I mean, you know, he, he, that was a compliment because he loved the damned. I found that out later, but when he said it to us, I wasn't sure if it was a compliment or not. I thought maybe it's an insult. Maybe it's a compliment. So I just, but I was like, you know, it's Lemmy. So I was just like, Oh, thanks man. I'm so, I'm he so just so figured funny. fast music. It's gotta be yeah. a punk band. Let's yeah. Figure. Well, I think LG Ward's in that band was in the damned, right? I, I never heard, I, I never really uh, knew much about them. Right. But he, he yeah. made that to us and I thought, well, that's uh that, that I hope that's a compliment. And I yeah, thought you, you should have said, Hey, you sound like the Ramones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When they, <laughs> when they do the, especially when they do the song Ramones, but right. Uh, exactly. yeah, song, yeah. No, I, yeah. Motorhead was a huge revelation for me in my life. The, the first album, because Canada did not get the first few albums uh, domestically um, until later. Ace of Spades was the, was actually the big debut of Motorhead in Canada. I'm assuming in the U S it was probably similar. Yeah. Uh, Canada and the U.S. are very linked when it comes to, like, we're region one, and it's like North America. So um, the, so Motorhead's first album that we heard was Ace of Spades. I'd been into music for a long time up to that point, right? It was 81. I was 17 or whatever. So, um, but, you know, Campanolo, my bass player, was the guy who introduced me to them. He said, hey, you got to check out this band Motorhead. I, I picked up this new album. He said, they're like nonstop, butt kicking rock and roll. And I'm like, really, eh? So we bought it, and uh, yeah, man, that was it. It was like, I was just, side two, especially, right? Because in North America, side two started with Ace of Spades. Side one started with Chase is Better Than the Catch. Oh. But in Europe, the first song on the album was Ace of Spades. I didn't know that. I found out later. So for us, we listened to side one, which is all solid and heavy, but not particularly high speed. But then side two is just like, it just seemed like at that time, 1981, it just seemed like unbelievable just a wall of speed and i remember playing it for my older brother who doesn't have the same taste as me in terms of heaviness he likes hard rock but he's not a metal real metal guy and he listened to me he went oh those guys are fucking punk and he walked out you know it's like i didn't like them i'm like i think they're fantastic <laughs> <laughs> so you know uh, that was uh, that was the the first uh, hearing of motorhead and that definitely i mean look what happened with Razor right anyway we started uh, if you look at Arden and dangerous our first ep oh yeah it was really Raven and Motorhead were the two bands that really um, influenced me. But bands that just blew me away when I heard their their, their debut albums. Because I got into them, well, it wasn't debut for Motorhead, but it was the North American debut. And then, of course, I went back and bought the imports. I went and I got the import for Bomber and the import for Overkill and the import for the first album, too. And there was uh, all these little cheesy EPs that that one of the other record companies was putting out on parole and beer drinkers. Oh and my God, those through, things! The, the Christmas thing with girls. Dave, school. We were, Dave did you ever like go have a drink with Lemmy? Sit around the table, you know, a couple of yeah. drinks, have supper, and. Well, he came to the dressing room and talked to us after. We never went out for dinner with him or anything, but he came talk to us after the, the show and come down to the to our. We have different, different dressing room. And you just come down and you bring drinks, right? And that was the yeah, thing. Right. We had a lot of alcohol all the time. And uh, he was giving a lot of whiskey to our sound guy, which I'm not sure what the reason for that was, but whether or not he was <laughs> trying to uh, sabotage us or what. I don't think that – Motorhead doesn't need to sabotage anybody. They're so amazing. I don't think about Motorhead is how fucking loud they were. Oh, that's my yeah, God. Yeah, During yeah. sound check, it was just so – I mean, oh my God! It was like, hey man, you guys are right on the line between Pain. PSH. We're we're gonna all leave here with fucking ear damage, man. It's so fucking loud, um, like uh, painful. Like yeah, it was painful, painful, loud. Yeah. Yeah, and we're you know, and I, this is coming from a metal musician myself, right? I was like, I love it loud, but holy Jesus, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. Have you, I, I've always, man, I've always wondered this. I mean, I've been in bands and whatever, and I had to, at a certain point, start wearing earplugs and whatnot, like a pussy. Yeah. Did you ever have to resort to this over time or any of yes, this? My friend. Yes, I do. I got my earplugs right here. It's it's too bad. <laughs> I have no choice. I have to protect what I got. Don't forget, I have no sight now. My sight is shit. I got to protect my hearing, right? Right. So I, yeah, yeah. Ones, I wear these ones, though, right? They're they're the flesh tone so that they're not that easy to detect but i do have those in yeah there's nothing wrong with that no it has to be done it has to be maybe when i was 18 there was something wrong with that but not now you know well we have to do it at this point we have to do it because otherwise i won't i'll be helen keller and i don't you know no no but i hope i didn't offend anybody with that but that'll be what will happen as it stands you're daredevil 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, uh, just want to make sure that uh, I protect what I've got left of my hearing. So and my hearing's important, too, because uh, of course. I'm still... I produced the new album, um, and uh, I'm fussy about what I what I what I want for it to sound like. Like right now, there's one last step before the record's ready to go into production, and that is the mastering. And I've been working with the guy in Los Angeles uh, um, via telephone for about three weeks now, trying to get it mastered correctly. He sent me a bunch of versions, and I had to make him fix them, um, which is disappointing because really, you figure mastering is just the last step, and it shouldn't be changing things much but there were some changes in the tone that i didn't like so i'm still making them fix that so all right i'm gonna ask you about cover uh redoing songs but i'm gonna say dave whelan has given you 30 dollars. so just a hats off Thanks. to a uh, dave whelan who just donated 30 dollars. and this is a funny comment queen bodisha says uh so this is the singer from the band razor and i think they're referring to you razor <laughs> yes <Chris>. it is <laughs> And who's the guy with the hat? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean this in a very um, funny way. No, I don't mean this in mean way or any sort. No, um, he's 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 the guitarist. It's 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 okay. It's okay. He's, you get asked this a lot. He he hasn't talked about himself nearly enough to be the singer. No, uh, that's, that's <laughs> Razor Fist is not the singer of Razor. <laughs> <laughs> Razor Fist is not the singer of Razor. No, that's not how that No, works. he's he's a separate entity. Yeah. He's on YouTube. He's a rageaholic. Right. Razor Fist. <laughs> so just it just so happens to be his name is Razor Fist. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's a good choice of a name. Right. <laughs> Trade. Think I stole it from. Jesus Christ. No, I actually stole it from Alice Cooper, but whatever. <laughs> Who's um, more qualified to talk to Razor than Razor Fist, honestly? Nah, exactly. Long. That's it's, what I'm saying. It's, it's yeah. cool. Um, what about redoing? I know you told me about this a few years ago. Redoing some of the older material, like uh, I don't know, maybe Evil Invaders or songs <laughs> off the Armed and albums. Dangerous stuff. I Armed mean, it's, hard, to, it's hard, hard for a lot of people to get. Well, you know, some people get, well, Armored Dangerous should be a little easier now because Relapse just did a reissue on Armored Dangerous. So it is more available than it used to be. Relapse can, can um, uh, you know, like they say, they, they can cover the whole world with it now. But it was kind of very quiet the way it went out. It just kind of, nobody really, no fanfare. We just kind of gave it to them and they put it out. Um, but yeah, it shouldn't be hard to find if you Google it or if you uh, go to Relapse's website or, you know, and a High Roller Records also sells it. But as far as recording old stuff, I thought about it over the years and I get so many people who are like purists who just like, they just cringe at the idea of me doing that. You know, they're like, Oh no, don't do that. Those are classics. Don't, don't remake them. Don't redo them. Don't do, you know, like don't mess with them. Just leave them as they are. And, you know, I get a lot of that. So it's always been kind of in the back of my mind that uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't bother doing something like that. We did the live album, which came out in 2016. Again, not, not a lot of fanfare. Um, it was mainly a release that was designed for Japan, and then we decided to put it out all over the world. But it's from a, one of our uh, one of our trips to uh, Japan, where we did uh, a couple of shows in Osaka, and we uh, we taped it and uh, we put that out. And so we have the live album that so you you can hear the, the old songs of Bob Reed singing them. Um, you know, a lot of the old songs are on that album. So especially uh, especially from Evil Invaders and Executioner's song. I think the only malicious intent song is Tear Me to Pieces. But, uh, you know, check out our live album. It's pretty good. I, I think it holds up. And it's not touched up. That's I have that album that, somewhere. I just don't have it right here. He didn't uh, touch it at all. You'll hear it. Like, like they're, 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 you can hear the mistakes. And Bob's actually uh, a little salty about it when we talk because there's some points, points where he actually forgot the words. And they're in the record. And he goes, oh, did you have to pick a song where I forgot the words? I'm like, well... We was two concerts we taped, and you didn't. This was the best version of both, so that's what you get. So right. you, know, you guys are popular in Japan, right? Yeah, they, well, yeah, we do. We, you know what? It's funny. Everywhere uh, except where we are is where we usually tend to be more popular. Like Europe and Japan and South America love Razor, and um, uh, Canada and the U.S. I, I would say that we're underexposed in the U.S. I, I think we, we every time we go to the states, we pick up new fans. We always find people who are like, I didn't know who you guys were. I can't believe it, right? That happens a lot in America. 
Uh, well, my, my, my gateway it, song was, of course, e Evil Invaders, you know, when that video came out. Yes, on, uh, of course. We're a lot I'm of not sure Still what, what a killer was... video, probably with a budget of five bucks, but fantastic. <laughs> Freaking fantastic. Great I love song. how the I... alien, the a invading aliens are just dudes in motorcycle helmets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's my right. favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. That's what you can do with that's what you can do with ten bucks. Pause guys, pause, pause. Steel Prophecy has donated twenty five bucks and he's saying, Hi there, Godspeed, would you mind sharing opinion on sacrifice? And I'm thinking he's referring to the band Sacrifice. I'm assuming yeah, my opinion or, or a razor fist. Like, would you mind I sharing opinion on sacrifice? Well, you know, razor fist you can Feel free to uh, step in and give your opinion on sacrifice. The sure. Band. Or Dave. Dave, will you probably okay, well, I'll go first. I'll go first. Sacrifice are my best friends in the metal world. So you already know what I think of them. Okay. First of all, besides the fact that they're good friends, I think they're brilliant musicians. Uh, they are the kind of people that have your back all the time. Super loyal, super cool super not arrogant, super not full of themselves. Uh, you know what I mean? Just nice guys. You meet them, you talk to them, they have a beer with you. They're those kind of guys. Um, they, uh, they're just, we came up with them, right? They did a lot of shows with us back in the early days. Um, you know, we met them. They, they came to one of our first shows in Toronto and they gave us a copy of their demo. It was called the exorcism at the time. And, um, you know, so I just love those guys. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly, say anything other than um it's a pleasure to have uh friends like that in the uh, in the you know in the metal world right so um okay. we loved we did tours with them in um uh 89 and 90 we went across all of canada hit every city that had more than fifty thousand people we did uh northern united states with them as well and uh man what a lot of fun no egos in the room and i say that and i tell you that i've played with a lot of bands and I've encountered a lot of people, some pure, nothing but dicks, and other people, unbelievably cool. I know what Razor Fist is saying. Which ones? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> Which are the dicks? Tell me the dicks. Coolest. Hey, Sacrifice are the coolest guys I've ever met. And, uh, um, you know, if you don't know that band, check them out. They're heavy as fuck. And um, we may have influenced each other a little bit over the years. But the bottom line is, is that, uh, yeah, there were some bands out there that, that I played with that left a pretty shitty taste in my mouth too, um, because clearly they were um, they were very carried away with themselves. And that's just one thing. I just have so little time for pretension and that fucking horseshit getting carried away with yourself. Um, there's you know just because you're a musician doesn't mean you're 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 uh, you know like a fucking superior human being. Like give me a fucking break. Um, you do something. You know you may have a talent, a specific talent, and it's awesome and sharing it with people and everything. But you know, you don't have to walk around like you're, you're better than everybody else just because you do that. I, I, I'm the anti-rock star when it comes to that kind of shit. Right. Okay. Raise your fist. What, what do you think of, uh, speaking of, you, you were talking about the old, the, the old days, you know, touring around Canada and whatnot. There's a new uh, wave of heavy metal that's been going on uh, of late, and Canada's one of the epicenters of it. What do you think of some of these bands that have been coming up, like, uh, you know, Riot City or, you know, whatever, the the, the bands that have been popping up? Striker. <laughs> Striker's another one. Um, Unleash the Archers is another uh, is another one, I believe. But uh, Cauldron, yeah. of course, has been around for years. They're great. Right. Okay. But, well, I am brutally underinformed in this area and would be nothing but a... Uh, a uh, um, <laughs> a jerk if I tried to offer an opinion on it because I I don't I'd have to hear it first to really give you. My oh, you haven't opinion. played with any of them or anything. No, I'm like the show. old farts that you know, like I mean, it's like if you introduce me to Motorhead and I, you know, like, Remy, what do you think of the Razor? Like, let me be like, I just saw them. They sound like the Damned. Like, <laughs> you know, like I I just honestly I haven't had a chance. It doesn't mean that they're not good. Sometimes I hear something new and it blows me away, and I go, "Who the fuck are those guys?" And then I don't even remember, unfortunately. But I've had some bands that I've heard that really grabbed my attention and were really good, and I was like, "I don't know who those guys are, but they're fucking good." And uh, you know, unfortunately, I never really uh, you know made the extra effort to to find out who they were. People tend to bring me things. I don't I don't really seek out much shit. People go, "Hey, mm -hmm. check this out," and uh, I'll you know. And then sometimes I get um, that all day long. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't seek out anything new at this point in my life. I guess I'm just, I just sit around and if people bring me something cool, then I, I'll, I'll give it the time of day for sure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Spotify uh, yeah. will suggest something to me, 
And then I'll hear something like, hey, those guys are pretty good. You know, like Dave, check out this band. (laughs) That's how a lot of these bands are getting noticed, actually, is Spotify. But yeah. yeah. So too, because I mean, I'll put something on just like one song. Go, I feel like hearing this, and I'll put it on. The next thing you know, if you don't pause it, it goes into the next song, and you hear something you never heard before, and you go, "Wow, that's pretty good, right?" It's like you know. How do you, how do you feel about Spotify, by the way? Because I know artists are kind of you know that there seem to be of of two minds about it. You're either in yeah. one camp or the other because it's you know I know they kind of pay peanuts, but yeah. the exposure yeah. on the other hand. That's what it is, right? Like a band like mine, the way I look at it is, people used to ask me the same thing about people uploading my albums onto YouTube, right? And they say, oh, you know, there's an album that's got like, you know, a couple hundred thousand hits and you're not, uh, you're not um, getting any money for it. Does that bother you? I'm like, no, it doesn't bother me at all. I've been, as a musician, I hate to say this, and this it doesn't mean I'm happy about it, but as a musician, I've been ripped off constantly in my life. I mean, it's, it's been a constant problem. It always comes down to the artist always seems to be the person who they think needs to be paid the least. And I don't understand yeah. that uh, mentality. I know that you get with promoters and especially with some promoters and some uh, like these are questionable ones, not good ones. But they think, oh, just because you're in a band and you get the accolades of maybe you get recognition or you get people want to buy you a drink or they like they think that should be compensation enough for what you do. And it's like. Well, if that's what you think, there'll never be any real art created because people can't, people have bills to pay no matter what they do for a living, bud. And, uh, you know, we have to spend our time um, writing music and putting music together. It's, it's, could be a labor of love, but it needs to be compensated because we're doing it at the expense of something else we could do with our time. Right. So, you know, it it kind of, uh, it kind of chaps me, but that's just how it is. But at the same time, Band like Razor needs all the new well, this, this This goes back to the business model we were talking about before. Yeah. You know, if you've got that education, either self-education about business or in school, you can sort of structure your own model and how to promote your band. Because let's face it, once you go to a label, you ain't going to see anything. Oh, Any yeah. label, large, small, you know, it's... But if you do it yourself, and again, I don't... Not all labels, I'm just saying in general... You know, if you, I mean, if the traditional label model, this is why I've always argued, like, I don't I don't feel like metal in general, not just thrash, not just hair metal, not just whatever, but metal in general didn't so much die off as it was sort of killed off. The record companies got to the point where they sign, this is the cycle of record companies. They sign these young, hungry bands for peanuts for very yep. little, they exploit them for the first several records. They sign them to some three, four record deal. And, you know, they're not paying them much. They're touring like crazy. They are getting starting to get money if they get popular, but it, you know, not as much as they would if they had signed a decent contract, obviously. No, that's so true. That's so and true. then it they, comes they, around, they, they it, it on, comes they, around a little yeah. later. It's suddenly it's time to re-sign them and they can afford lawyers now. And oh, wouldn't you know it, we've got a new toy. It's a new genre coming around the yeah, corner. Yeah, they do that. And you know, let me tell you, the kind of deal that we signed in 1984 with Attic Records, which is the company that went bankrupt, that got took over by the other states. Um, what happened was they signed us to a deal that is now illegal to sign in Canada. You can't even <laughs> sign in Canada. It's illegal. It's called a cross collateralization, cross collateralization deal. Hard for me to talk ever since I had my face partly paralyzed five years ago, but that's another issue. Let's uh, add to the tragedy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, that, the video of me that you did with me where I was paralyzed five years ago, where my face, but anyway. On, you know, I was always, and I'm not making fun of you. I'm just, I'm just, I just, I, I just <laughs> shocked at the amount of tragedy and what you've gone through. It's just, it, I, I know. I, it no was, one, was, no human should have to go through all this no, that you've gone it's through. It's horseshit. I mean, honestly, it is. It is horseshit. I mean, I could like, say. You know, there was what, like an attack of Bell's palsy or something? Yeah. I got, see, I came back from South America and uh, I, we did a show and it wasn't because of South America. I, I, what happened was, this is a comedy of, uh, of errors again. The person who I will not name because they, 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 they get upset, although I was not happy. The person who drove us to the airport for the uh, trip to, to South America in 2017 was sick, which is an unbelievably stupid thing to be, to take a band for a very grueling trip that we're about to take, to be sick in the car with them when you take them to the airport is a very bad thing to do because we're now going out and we're going to be exhausting ourselves traveling and performing. And these people, I'm sorry, I have a candy in my mouth. 
Okay. These people, uh, uh, so so like the chance of getting us sick is going to be a lot higher. And back then there was no mask or anything. And she, you know, and she was coughing and hacking and stuff in the car. And I am a germaphobe already. I've got all kinds of fucked up issues. So I was there going, oh, my God, I hope we don't get sick. Who gets sick on the trip more than anybody? Me. And when I came home, I was a wreck. Just horrible shape. And uh, almost had to go to the hospital in Paraguay. That's how bad it was. Anyway, um, bottom line is, is got, got, uh, got home and um, slept for about two or three days. Uh, not, not all at once, but I mean, two or three days of trying to rest and get back to reality and recover from the trip. And uh, I woke up and my face was paralyzed. I thought I was having a stroke. Jeez. But I was having a stroke. I went, I, went, I went to see my wife and I went, Rose, I'm having, I think I'm having a stroke. So anyway, to summarize this quickly, it turned out it was Bell's palsy. And I had uh, about four months of that. Four months of my face, this side of my face, which still hasn't completely recovered. You can see it when I taught a little bit on this side, paralysis. Um, so I've got that. My eye doesn't close right at night anymore. The right eye. So now my eye waters all night. So I got to put ointment in my eye like like uh, like uh, like ointment in my eye every night to keep it from drying up um it's just total bullshit and it all started with somebody taking us to the airport sick so yes i'm blaming somebody it was was not cool but which, uh, which is but, our moral here you know there, there's a moral to the story and that's how problems go from country to country right you yeah, can bring in yeah. covid right if you're sick right. just don't go into another would, country or don't go with people or is, give them lifts you know <laughs> yeah the lesson there is don't be a bonehead yeah, if you're yeah, sick yeah, don't yeah. be driving people to the airport tell them you can't make it exactly we'll, we'll, be we'll more take considerate a be considerate that's the yeah word. they weren't thinking about it they weren't thinking about it and that's what happened and then i got shingles okay so it oh, wasn't there bad you go. There after you go. the palsy ended a month later i got shingles and i had shingles for four months so that was a great year, 2017. I think like, they wrote a book in the Bible about you. I think <laughs> Must be, eh? <laughs> the book of Dave. <laughs> Is it right after the boils? <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, like, I mean, and that's what I'm saying. You know, you, you would think that it's been enough, right? I started to think maybe I was the reincarnation of Hitler or something. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? Am I doing a penance for something? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Dave, yeah. go back to the contract where I cut you off. Go back. Okay, so, oh, and let me just say, Anonymous gave you 20 bucks. Jake Small gave you 10 bucks. So thank you very much. Thank you very All much. Right. And oh, it. oh, here up. Oh, here's a big one. And Gara Johnson. Gara, Gara Johnson, $200. Oh, okay. Thank you so right. much. These these are on your GoFundMe right now. Okay. Okay. I, beautiful. I'm at 175 bucks on YouTube. So. All right. Oh my, thank you so much. I really Let's talk it. about and 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 it, if you guys have to go, by all means, just tell me. I got I still have time, but if you have to leave, Dave and Razor Fist, if you have something to do, it's all good, no problem. We'll uh, you know. Okay. We'll, well I'll we'll stay break. with you guys. Do what you want, and then if you you know you get tired and you want to be done, that's cool too. It's all it's up to you guys. You're good, Razor Fist. Uh, you're good. I, I'm I'm good. I'll I'll let you know when I have to tap out. Yep. Right. Okay. Right. When you tap out, I'm tapping out when you tap out, just so you know. Or you can <laughs> just take a little nap now and we could just continue and you can wake up. I'll wake you up in 10. Okay. But anyways, go. Right. <laughs> okay. So anyway, you can't sign the kind of contract that we signed back then. It was a seven year deal and, and uh, a seven album deal. And it was over uh, five years. And what Attic did to us was, was I mean, I, I'm sorry, but it wasn't cool. Okay. I don't like to be, I don't like to sound like a whiner because I read interviews with other people that Say so it sounds like whine. I don't like whining all the time, but I have to point out that what they did to us was they took our songs from Armed and Dangerous. They made us put some of that on the Executioner song album, so we had to leave songs off that we had recorded. We actually recorded a follow up to uh, Armed and Dangerous, a full length album, eleven songs, and they wouldn't let us release that, which is what we wanted to do because Armed and Dangerous sold well. So of course, being business guys, they had to go and force us to put some of the songs on there. So they did that. And then when they saw that Executioner song was selling okay, and they were happy with that, they went, oh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take all the rejected songs from Executioner song and the other ones that left over from Armored and Dangerous, we're going to put that on as your second album. And I went, what? No, you won't. We can't do that. You're gonna, that's career suicide. I mean, those songs, like, as an aggregate, it isn't it isn't going to be a strong album. Let us make a new album. I had to beg them to let me write Evil Evaders. And I had to write it in like 
I wrote that album in less than a month. I had to write it like a like a maniac. Um, I see less than a month. I think I probably wrote it in a couple of weeks. I don't remember, but we recorded it in three days. Three days. Wow. We got three days. Uh, 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 two days to record, one day to mix, and 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 they and then that one sold well. And so what did they do? They um, they made us do another album in six months later. Six months later, they started talking about putting out that old shit again as our third album. I like, so I had to write malicious intent to keep them from putting the old shit out again. Uh, as our third album, it's just like there's such dinks because all they can think about is we have this material sitting in a closet we need to release and make money. But fine, if you want to release it as a as a secondary release, but don't call it my new album, you morons. All right. If that's if that's what they were doing, right? And, they, so, and Dave, if, Dave, just pause there. They wanted the thrash scene was sort of like getting bigger, and they want Canada. They wanted Canada to have their own sort of little thrash uh band or you know on the label and 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 how did that work out like they go yeah, did they thousand, understand thrash did wish, they understand I speed wish, i wish that was true what was really <laughs> true was what was really true was they wanted to make some quick easy money okay all they really cared about was lee Aaron. wasn't it yeah cared. i was gonna what say was wasn't it, i had heard your interviews before and i thought you were on the same label with lee yeah, Aaron, and was. they lee were Aaron. over the moon <laughs> for her nothing is wrong with lee Aaron. I yeah know. yeah but, but my issue with Lee Aaron is isn't with Lee Aaron at all. It's with Attic Records. Okay. Yeah. They put every nickel and dime and resource they had into Lee Aaron and her career, at the expense of anybody else on their roster except the Nylons, who were like an acapella band who were also selling a lot of records. I remember the so Nylons. What Lee Aaron was is that every time we needed something, they'd say, "Well, we're we're we're, we're you we've used up our money on Lee Aaron. We haven't got money for you." Uh, we, we, not, we need for the Tigers on Metal Queen video. <laughs> hey, they, had, they, help Lee they didn't have any money for us. And that's fine. They didn't recognize us as viable commercially. They didn't think yeah, so. They yeah, thought, yeah. here are a bunch of guys who make economical records. And because they're economical, we can sell them and make some easy money. That's all it was about. There was no thrash, caring about thrash or scenes or any of that shit. It was all bullshit. They were just suits that wanted to make money. Period. And that was our mistake that we signed with them because honestly, it was a mistake because Metal Blade wanted to sign us too. And we didn't do that. We went with um, we went with uh, Attic because we thought Anvil got a chance to go to Japan and to Europe and everything because of Attic. Yeah. We figured, well, if we get at least what Anvil got, we will get a chance. We will make an impression and we will get somewhere. But you know what happened? They lost a lot of money on Anvil. They kept telling us that. Besides the fact that they didn't have any money because of Lear, and they also said, besides, we tried that with Anvil and it didn't work. We tried, because we'd say, could you give us some tour support so we could tour Europe? Because we'll be big over there if we get a chance. Can you give us some money to help us do something to promote the band? We did it with Anvil, it didn't work. We did it with Anvil, it didn't work. We just kept hearing that. So because of whatever they thought they did with Anvil, we got no resources there. So they basically deceived us. They signed us under the premise that they would, um, you know, uh, that they would uh, help build our career. And then we just kind of got left uh, left out. Now- Even Megaforce, did you get approached by uh, Johnny Zazula? Never got approached by Megaforce. Never got, never, never, never. Remember, something about me that's maybe a bad thing about me is that I don't go hunting for stuff too much. You know, people will say to me, why don't you have a sponsorship on your guitars? Why don't you have this? Why don't you do that? Well, honestly, I don't ask. I'm not an asker, okay? Maybe I should be, because I know, and the thing is, without a manager and without uh, good uh, agents and management behind you, you got to ask or else you're not going to get shit. And I didn't have anybody pushing for me. We, we didn't have a yeah. good manager. I would have killed for a good manager. We tried to get Helix's manager interested in Razor. He was marginally interested because he knew Armed and Dangerous sold well. But at the end of the day, he went, you're too heavy. I can't do anything with you. We tried to get the manager of the Killer Dwarfs to, to do us. Okay. He looked at us. He thought we were a joke. He didn't have any use for us at all. So like it's just like, you know. We couldn't get, they thought we were just too heavy. They just thought, uh, they, you know, meanwhile, they also thought Slayer was a joke too. That's so, why you should have hooked up with somebody in the U.S., you know, where they, they have yeah. more visionaries yeah. like a Bryce. We really, we really needed to, but we were, we were young and stupid, right? Like we were 20 yeah, years old. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. for sure. It's easy to look back now. Yeah, and I'm not saying everybody who's 20 or 19 is stupid, by the way. Please don't take it that way. I'm just saying, our, we were naive in, at that time. 
And, uh, you know, we weren't getting any good uh, advice from anybody. You were ahead of the curve, though, in other ways. You were ahead of the I mean, you guys, didn't you, when you came to the States, I mean, it wasn't like you you set the world on fire down there, but you spent some time down in Texas. That was before Texas became a big hotbed for Pantera. That was before then. You know what I mean? Like, you were ahead of the curve in some ways. Some ways we were, but, you know, like, the thing is, is that it just, I, I just really wish we had had a good agent even even if we didn't have a manager just a good yeah. an agent that would help us uh you know because that was another thing we lost out on right we didn't network with other bands that we should have i mean we eventually did the sacrifice because i was friends with sacrifices manager but the other guys the other bands that that we um uh you know had a chance to play with we, we could have done a, a number of amazing tours and we never got a chance we just never got the opportunity because um, we couldn't get an in- agent interested in us, and we weren't looking in America like we should have been. We were still, we were still trying to stay in Canada, which yeah. I don't know what. And, and a lot of people don't realize for Canadian bands, you know, we think go to the U.S., go to the U.S. Well, you know, there's green, you know, there's work permits, you know, there's there's a lot. Of Everything costs more. Over there. Everything costs more. Yeah. It's, oh, uh, I, I, I did a, vi- a video on a Japanese band, very famous Japanese band in Japan. Around us. Anthem and and they're oh, huge. Anthem, yes. They're Judas Priest huge in in Japan, yeah. but here nobody knows who they are. Yeah. And th- <laughs> there was this part where I, I learned all about this reading the Anthem Bible or whatever, where they had planned to do an American tour, one of like five different aborted attempts to tour America, and they were ready. They were set. They had the whole tour, the whole stage show. They had the whole build set up, and then the Gulf War happened, and the prices of everything shot yeah. up like twice. Just those little things, just being outside a country, everything yeah. costs more. Yeah. Go cool. well. I mean, when I when I, when I talked to the guys from Exciter, I mean, their biggest problem was they couldn't hook up with the U.S. bands of similar genre style because there's work permits involved. You know, you can't just spend eight months in the U.S. just like that as a Canadian, right? There's got to be the right paperwork. Some yeah. some yeah. some bands are lucky because they they have dual citizenship in the U.S. and they could make well, it go over the ball a lot easier. Uh, we have a, we we don't have too much trouble getting out of the states for shows now. Um, you know, like, like the musicians' union helps us. Uh, the, the musicians' union, the AF of M, American Federation of Musicians, actually represents Canadian and American musicians. Uh, it's the same union, so um, that's you know that's how we get our paperwork done. Now the thing is with with union, uh, what you have to do is you have to get a, a visa. Uh, the visa has has gone up substantially over the last five years. When we were doing shows in 2015, it was costing us about 300 bucks. It's now over a thousand bucks, which may not sound like much, but if you're only doing one show, that's a big that's a big hit for for that's for right. you know, overhead, right? If they have a ten thousand dollar budget to bring you down there to play at a festival or something, and then they got to pay hotel, they got to pay flights, they got to pay, and then they have to throw a thousand off the top for uh, for uh, you know a visa. The thing, though, is, is that you can actually put uh, up to uh, a good number of shows on one visa if you get a tour. So it's not that hard. Uh, it's just another step you have to do. But, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it, it'd be nice if we had a room where you didn't have to do that, but that's not reality. But, yeah, that's part of it. But the biggest thing is is just, uh, like I say, uh, you to stay down there would have been a much bigger uh, challenge paperwork-wise. We still could have done it. We would have had to have like a, a record company that was American Minds, like maybe Metal Blade or somebody like that. That's would right. Have been, That's right. Yeah, exactly. Being part, once we decided to go with Attic, we were basically saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do. You know, we always use the Rush model, right? We're like, oh well, Rush made it. They got they got they got uh, you know they got they got everybody big in the used state. the Rush model. <laughs> Triumph, Triumph was able to do it. So, you know, we should be able to do it, right? So that's kind of how we looked at it. It's, it's a lot easier when you're playing stadiums, though, right? And, and big theaters, you know. They're, well, they're... Rush was also opening for Kiss. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> slight that helps. slight that difference. Helps. Yeah, yeah. You get the tour with Kiss, you're, you're, you know, in 1975, that's not bad. You know, you factor in <laughs> gas prices, the exchange rate. You don't know what the exchange rate's going to be. Is it going to be to your benefit or not? Yeah. There's a lot. And then just doing a Canadian tour. I mean, geez, man, you know, you're driving across Canada. It's, it's, not, like, it's not like U.S., New York, Philadelphia, no, you know, no, New Jersey. You know, you got all these close proximity on the big cities or bigger cities. Canada's like, okay, Montreal, Toronto, that's okay. Wait a well, second. Know, Where are we going to go from Toronto, right? Like, it's, it's financially feasible. It can be done financially. But I'll tell you what, it's hard. It's the exhaustion of the travel. Um, yeah. Like we did it. We did a bunch of those. We Halifax all the way to Vancouver. 
Uh, you know, we did that a few times, but the thing is- That's it's, five days, it, that's like six days, isn't it? It's eight hours of driving between some of those shows, right? Like once you get from Toronto, once you get it past the East Coast and you come to Toronto, now you, the next show you're gonna do when you start to head towards uh, upper, you know, Northern Canada, you're gonna go up to like Sudbury probably, and then you gotta do Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay, Winnipeg, uh, Regina, Saskatoon. Uh, you know, like, but I mean, every every drive is at least six hours, six to eight hours. And, you know, that's just the drive. Then, you you know, you go out, you can't afford much of a crew. You can only bring usually one person to help you because it's just too expensive. So, you know, it's a lot of work, man. You're hand bombing your gear. You're, 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 yeah. uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. There on. should have always <laughs> been free trade between the U.S. and Canada when it came to like bands and touring. You know, there should have just been open borders for that. I don't know, understand why, like, but anyway. Well, you know, it's kind of like what it is in Europe. Now, right? Probably because people like Lemmy kept smuggling drugs across the border. <laughs> yeah, could be it, right? Well, I mean, when it comes to drugs, you can get drugs in Canada or the USA. So it's like, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if it makes much of a difference either which side you're on, right? So, right. And, and finally, America is starting to, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, catch up with, uh, like, they're, 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 the weed is getting legalized. And, you know, I mean, I just look at it this way with the weed thing. I mean, that's like, you know, I remember how weird my mother was about weed okay she's not around anymore but i just remember what a weirdo she was like how weed freaked her out and how she was like so horrified that anybody would touch it it's like she never knew anything about it right but it's just like everybody watched reefer madness i guess and they thought that you were you were going to smoke a joint jump off a building or whatever but it's and chong didn't help it's right. so nothing it's well hey man they were doing that they were doing a satire to try and uh, you know you know but you know i mean here's the thing okay i know that i'm just saying that we don't need to be so um, we don't need to be so uh, 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 hung up about these things. What you should do is if you're worried about people abusing things, you just kind of need to educate people on how to, you know, show some uh, toler some um, restraint, restraint, like and something some of my kids have an issue with, too, which is a little bit of restraint when necessary, you know, um, and a lot of guys in the music business have issues with restraint. I think we know that. No. Just a few. <laughs> okay. Like, I know Jimmy, Jimmy, I don't think, is a big proponent of weed either. I think he's had some had some uh, uh, stuff that's that may have been, hasn't worked out perfectly. Uh, some people some people can't handle weed, just like some people can't handle alcohol. Um, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I know people who it triggered schizophrenic breaks for people. It, it, it doesn't work for everyone. Right. I, but right. in most cases, it's totally I'm going to say this. For weed, and I know we're getting on the subject, I'm yeah. not against it to each their own, right? Yeah. Like alcohol to each their own. But I can tell you that the brain of a child going into adolescence to adulthood cannot handle that much drug, just like they can't handle alcohol or, you know, other stuff. Horror or movies. caffeine for crying out loud. Yeah. Yep. It, and it, it rewires the brain <clears throat> as that child develops into an adult. So there is an age where it's not really suited for you know certain demographics we'll say yeah, and everything I think frank marino is a good one i heard frank marino you know he you know he you know i used to speak to frank a lot the guitarist frank marino and uh, yep. you know he's told me many stories about you know his acid trip and he got locked up in a uh you know a crazy home because of it you know his acid trip and after it was so bad that he never touched a drug after that so different people different people different reactions and i'm not if to each their own hey you know i'm not hey, you know what let me ask you a question though have you guys ever tried acid either one of you no, guys no i was too scared did you try uh, acid? i had a girlfriend who did and you know she had been recommended it and whatever and uh mostly she said it just made her feel tired and she laid around and it was a little weird she didn't feel the need to do it ever again yeah, but yeah. it was just kind of a. She she said it was kind of weird and spacey. Yeah, I tried it once, and I'll tell you what it was like. I was sixteen. It was Halloween when I was sixteen years old, and I remember because I never tried it again either. Uh, but again, some people tell you acid's great and whatever you know. Like some people, it works for okay, but it didn't work for me. I took acid, and um, all I remember is um, we were uh, we were doing some drinking too and stuff. I went. I walked home from downtown the city I live in. Um, my head felt like it was, my neck felt like it was about a hundred feet long. And I remember my head being up where the telephone wires were. We had telephone wires, everything wasn't under there. And I remember looking down at the city and the city looked like it was all the houses were all like, I was in an airplane or something. And I was walking down the street like that, just going, this is fucked up, man. <laughs> and, and then I got home, somehow I managed to get to my house. 
and I was in bed and I said, I gotta get some rest. And I was in bed, it's probably about two o'clock in the morning. Well, at like seven o'clock in the morning, I was still lying there like this. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I, I know. I, I can't live like that. That's my thing. I just, I can't, okay. I can't, I can't. Well, I, that's, that's not just me. That's just me, though. I just, yeah. Well, yeah. That's not just you. That's me, too. That's not my definition. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's not yeah. My thing. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. So yeah, no, it's not. But, but you know, if anybody wants to hear Frank Marino, I mean, we had like an hour, two hour chat, you know, and uh, he talks all about this. And strange enough is if you guys know his music or not, it sounds like he's on acid trip and people always thought he was on acid trips. But the re reality was he was straight as an arrow. And, uh, you know, after scaring his mother half to death and himself half to death after his experience. But that was with acid. And uh, great guy, great guy, Frank Marino. Well, and you you may remember the uh, the infamous uh, the infamous sheepdog interview that we. we nah, did there we, you go. <laughs> sheepdog, there we go. Now <laughs> we're getting. Now we're talking. <laughs> Get him on the horn. <laughs> Never even mentioned it up till now, which is so so cool actually that you didn't. But um, the thing is, is uh, well, you know, it's kind of it, we've talked about it, I guess, right? And well, you know, yeah, I know Razor Fist has put it on, you know, on on the uh, on his. I mean, it's not something I could not talk about, you know, with the whole yeah. thing, obviously. But uh, yeah, he he hasn't been really. It's it's been on the DL for a while. Like it hasn't yeah, been. Uh, yeah. There's no. There's no. There's no. By the way, I got this is something that needs to be said here. Okay, and, um, there's no feud. Like people always use the word feud. No, oh, there's a feud. There's no feud. I'm not interested. Not in time for fucking feuds. Okay. Bottom line is, is that um, we were going to do a reunion. Um, we were going to do a reunion, not a permanent thing. I had never had any intention of doing a permanent re reunion. It was more like, we'll get together and we'll do some shows because I just had cancer. And I thought, well, just in case I don't stick around that long, let's, let's, let's give this one more thought, you know, one more thing. <clears throat> he called me to tell me he was, uh, you know, thinking about me when I had the cancer, which I thought was a nice thing to do. And uh, from there we had a conversation and we thought, well, maybe we'll do something. Out of nowhere, like another sucker punch in my life, I read an interview where he seemed to shit on me and a lot of stuff. It came out of nowhere. Nobody expected it. And by the way, that's another thing I, I forgot. Like in the Metal Mythos, it kind of said that we had a, a, a very, and you would, you would think this from reading his interview, that there was this terrible uh, a fractured history of the band. There wasn't any fractured history. It's more dramatic. It's more dramatic when you say it like that. <laughs> it's important to say. Between 1983 and 1987, when we played as a band, the four of us, there were no fights about anything. None. Stace was apparently holding all this shit in, and then he let it loose on that interview. I had no idea that he had all this, the, these observations about us. I didn't know the fact that that it mattered to him that we were of Italian heritage or something. He brought that up in the fight. He was like, What? When I met these guys, I realized all three of them were Italian. Like, what? Who even knows? I, I, I like think, the O, Carlo. Well, I don't even speak. I don't even speak Italian. <laughs> Names that end with an O. I love right. that part. That well, made me for, laugh. I you got to put a little him. humor in there, Dave. You got to put a little humor in there. Well, and I have, I have, I have. Uh, you know, uh, my relatives are Italian. Some of them are from Italy, and 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 some of my older relatives may not be with us anymore. But they, they, Italy was their first language. I, I love Italy. Italy's a wonderful country, and it's my heritage. But I am a Canadian, and I, I never thought that anybody would even notice that shit. Like I didn't notice his name was McLaren. I went, oh, he's I think he's Scottish. What? Who's who's evaluating everybody like that? I, I, we're not. Never Razor Fist it. sounds German. Razor Fist sounds German. You know, yeah, it's actually long. not wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's got the little umlaut and the. That is, yeah, but uh, I mean, no, it's you know... true. I'm half, I'm half German. I'm half uh, English. I'm at war with myself. Uh, there you go. Well, hey, man, now you know. Uh, bottom line, well, is... my parents are from Greece, so both my parents were born in Greece and they immigrated. Are you sure they're not from Greece too? Yeah, hey, it's your German side that must. I mean, I know actually, Greece two was never like, as good as Greece one, though. Okay, I never now, saw see, Greece. It was one, a motorcycle so instead of a car. Come on, I can't deal with that. Now, see, that will kill me. Like, like that kind of stuff is is like the hardest thing for me to cope with. Is stuff like Greece or or hairspray or like my daughter liked my daughter liked hairspray, and I mean, okay, she she was telling me about it and stuff, and it's my daughter, and I love her, so I let her tell me about it. But I mean. Want to torture me? Talk to me about hairspray or grease. Right. All right. Or talk to me about anything musical, like musical theater, musical anything, musicals. Oh, hang me, please! I can't handle musicals. Yeah. Funny, Funny thing, when Greece first came out, when I was a little kid, I thought it was about Greece. Oh yeah, Greece. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought it was. Oh, we're gonna watch a movie about Greece. Right. And there's, it's they're singing. 
Really? What's, what's I, 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 I went to Katz and I thought it was going to be about like a Jewish deli or something. <laughs> I, I, I've been to, I've been to see neither one of uh, Greece nor cats. I haven't, uh, um, you know, I luckily I haven't. Uh, right. Thank first, God. My parents brought you know, me to I do have, I do have a friend I was who, like, I do what have is a going on paid, here? Uh, I have a friend who paid $195 and this is a while ago because the tickets are probably more now, but it was $195 to see Phantom of the Opera. And he sat in the, in the front row with his wife and he fell asleep and his wife was so pissed. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I thought it was funny when I heard that story. Well, I'm happy my wife's a so rocker, so it's all good with that, you know. What kind of music does uh, Rose like, Dave? Rose likes, um, Rose listens to like uh, Bruce Springsteen and stuff yeah. like that. And like my she, wife, like, Foreigner, you know, Journey. Yeah, Foreigner, she, part of, she has, I don't, she never mentioned Foreigner, but she likes to like, on, she has serious, we have serious, she listens to like the Bruce Springsteen channel a lot and stuff like that, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, not really, not really, uh, not really my thing. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't throw darts at it. Everybody has their own. Hey, you know what? And I really don't, you know, I, I may say I don't. How many not... women from a percentage point show up to a razor show? Well, see, now you're asking a blind man. So I'm I mean, not talking about the girlfriends. Of the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, being blind, being blind, honestly, Jimmy, I don't see the audience. I don't percentage, see the audience. A percentage. A like, do, percentage. Like, does it attract? Say, does it... Yeah. Well, I would say it's probably, uh, it's probably maybe 15%, maybe 15, yeah. 20%. It's probably a little better now, I would think. I would. Yeah, think. yeah, I guess. Again, I can't see the audience. I can't tell. And honestly, that's one of the biggest. Well, from what I, they tell you, from what they tell you. <laughs> I, well, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm seeing the crowd, like if it's before a show or something, and yes. I'm getting I think 15, 20%, maybe. Plus, you know, sometimes we'll do, uh, like, uh, if it's a festival, we'll do an autograph session before. And I'm saying that's basically what I'd say. It's maybe one out of What about in Japan? Is there more of a, a higher yeah, female more ratio? Female fan, more female fans in Japan, I think. South America? Is there more female? I would think more females yeah, in South America. Yeah, I think so. I think more female fans actually everywhere except North America. Like, probably yeah. Europe, Japan, and South America, more female fans, yeah. They've been yeah. cultivated we, in North America for more melody. They like more melody, you know, less. They like of, hairspray. Yeah. Where, where is this? In North where, America, they sort of grew North up America. with more melody, like to like more melody. And not the new generation of girls. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're yeah. sort of into like, you know, the thrash and the yes, speed and yeah. all that. Yeah. My daughter, my daughter likes everything. She, she, yeah. she'll listen. And she may have been into hairspray in Greece when she was younger. Now she, she listens to everything. She listens to all kinds of stuff. Um, and again, everybody's got the right to like whatever they want. And I, I'm not, I don't like to throw darts to anybody for liking anything. Cause I like, I like smooth jazz music. Okay. I play piano too. Right. Okay. It's not like back in 1984 where everybody had to pretend that all they listened to was the hardest metal all the time. And if it was anything else, you're a poser and a wimp and a loser. It Strange is. Like, enough, when I went to high school, Dave, you know, you couldn't say you liked the song by Duran Duran. It was just like suicide, you know, like right. they would just, yeah. like well, today you, know, you and that's just an example of you had to stick to your genre yeah. <laughs> in high school. You had to stick to it. Like I had my Van Halen patches, my Iron Maiden stuff, yeah, but I yeah. couldn't say I like that new Duran Duran song where they thought I was weird. Yeah. Well, was, you know, this, the thing is, is that, you know, it's, it's, it's people, you know, like, come on, there's a lot of peer pressure back at that age, right? I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. you get to our age, cool. you start to laugh at it and you go, okay, listen, this is, you know, if somebody likes that music, what, what does that do to you what is that so well, who cares Plus, yeah I, I feel like record companies kind of fostered that a little bit too and mtv a little bit the yeah. genre wars yeah. and whatever but back then they could afford to because you know millions of records were being sold instead of a few tens of thousands or That's whatever cool. so razor fist you're back in high school what were you listening to with oh. not metal non -metal. Uh, punk i was really into punk yeah, okay uh, non-punk yeah. other than non-punk oh other God. than punk was there anything else you liked? Maybe throw you out something like an aha. No, or I was something. a. I, don't I know. was a. No, look, I I was raised in the youth group. I listened to a lot of Christian music as a, as a oh, kid. Okay. Was, you know, so yeah, because I'll tell you, probably why I have such an affection for Striper to this day. I, oh yeah, wow. I noticed that, that you covered Striper. You covered Striper in one of your uh, your Metal Midlast pieces, and uh, you know, like the thing is, um, there's there's a lot of stuff we like. Like I liked Foreigner, right? Like I talked about that in one of my YouTube videos. I like I, I I thought that they when they played a heavy song they did a good job right um you know and I think Lou Graham honestly has one of the best voices in, in, in music down. period in music just period. too bad he's not in the band anymore uh, you know you know that's yeah I know but he, he, the guy they've got though I think sounds like it doesn't it's he? good he yeah. can sing still though it's yeah. nice that he's actually back for after his you want to talk tra health travails for crying out loud right <laughs> 
Yeah, you can't, I mean, look, and you know what? You know, you can't expect people when they hit their sixties, seventies, and eighties to sort of be who they were in their twenties, right? I mean, well, you'd uh, hope not. You'd hope. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I it's get that be, too. There's gotta be. But some what are, come on, Razor Fist, give me some more bands that other than punk and metal that you listen to. Okay, Christian music. Okay. Oh, okay. I was wait. Okay, well, look, I'm I'm big time into like R and B and stuff like that. I've I've always been like that. I'm a huge Michael Jackson. Mark, I did a whole bunch of videos about Michael Jackson. And uh, Stevie Wonder, I'm a huge fan of and all that. You know, so it's not just that. And then I even like some of the, you know, just 80s poppier bands like Device and stuff like that. I like AOR a lot. You know, that's that's all stuff on the side uh, that I do. Nothing wrong with any of that. And that's the thing, right? That's the cool thing is that you can like metal and you can be like that and you can do a metal series and you can have taste in other types of music. And that, I think, is just means you're, you 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 know, versatility of, of, of taste is cool. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, no, when I was younger, you know, it was like, oh, no, you know, you got to be this, right? Dave, even, I wore, I, Dave, I wore a Nirvana shirt and people just like, so many people got mad at me. Joy yeah. Division, that's another band that's... that's a, you wore what? I wore a Nirvana <laughs> shirt and everybody just... I think it's a great Nirvana. Nevermind was a great album. I don't know. I just don't I do it. I mean, so how... Do so about to... Shotgun Justice. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I kid, yeah. I kid. No, no. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Stone Temple Pilots made a good album too back then too. Core was sure. a good album. I, I, I liked that album. I, I like Pearl Jam. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I don't know their stuff that well. I don't there know you go. Stuff that's that what you're referring to. <laughs> yes, great yeah, album. That's the reissue of Shotgun Justice. Yes, yes. That's, that's the album that. Uh, that's a that good was... remaster, by the way. It is. Yeah, they yeah, did yeah, a really is. good job. It is. They did it a is. really good job. Right. So I guess you know what? Let me just check the numbers here. I know yep. that we've been on for, oh boy, we've been on for almost two hours. Yeah, we're probably ready to wrap up. And I appreciate you guys yeah. your time. To Anonymous gave you 50 bucks. And I want to thank everybody out there for, uh, you know, all their support for Dave. I want to thank Razor Fist for jumping on. Oh, you're going to play us out with the tune. I'll give you, I'll give you a sound here. You know what I got here, guys? This is, my, um, this is my, this uh, is my, you, know, you can't see it, but I'm going to show it in my YouTube video. This is the one, the album I used to make, or the amp I used to make Violent Restitution. And so check out Dave Carlo Razor on YouTube, by oh, the way. Yeah. Dave Carlo Razor, type it in. He's got his own channel. Yes, please check me out. I need, I need more listeners or more uh, viewers. Uh, viewers, sorry, listeners. It's okay. Dave Carlo Razor, and of course, Razor Fist, the Rageaholic. Sure. You know what? If you're playing, we can't hear you because there probably is a, a delay. Dropsy. No, I think there's an issue with the, uh, I think the yeah. volume's cutting out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, can you hear us? Yeah, it's not working, Dave. You can't hear it? It's no, it's not. Can't working. hear it. I think maybe you have like a volume limiter or something on uh, your, so, like it's it's loud enough that it's trying to cut it off or something. Because it, cause it's coming through here and there, but I think it's uh, there's like a limiter or something. Can you hear this? Well, we can hear that, but we can't play. Just the string that. strumming. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus. Okay, never mind. Okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll get all right. It's all right. We'll, so, okay. Fuck let's it. We'll do it live. <laughs> get my YouTube let's, channel. let's end off with this. When can we expect this? New, oh, Jesus. I asked you this question like three years ago. When can well, we expect the new yeah. album? Okay. Final thing I'll say here to so we can guys can get on with our days. Set it straight. How what happened here? I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of what happened, why the album took so damn long. Because we did an interview three years ago and the record was supposed to be coming out then. Okay. So let's update it and tell you what happened. The world caught on fire. Yeah, pretty much. 2018, <laughs> we were gonna record this record. Uh second half of 2018. Uh first it was gonna be 2017. You guys know about Bell's palsy and shingles. That ruined it. 2018 gigs the first half of the year second half of the year we were going to record it but my drummer unbeknownst to me announced that he was taking a two-month course training course in running heavy machinery equipment so he could get a second income and he, he took out the window that we had set up to record the album and it fucked things up and then a whole bunch of shit happened at that period of time which culminated with Ryder leaving the band at the end of 2018 so then we started with a new drummer Reef and he was in the band for six months and we had um, plans to record the album with him. Uh, we had to get, you know, we had to get him up to speed to make the album and do some shows. So then by uh, summer of 2019, 
we were going to record again. So what happened was we weren't 100 percent sure it was working out perfectly with Reef. So we ended up um, Ryder uh, was available to come back and we just thought the chemistry of Ryder was better. So we brought him back. But that wiped out the second half of 2019 because we had uh, gigs to play. Plus, you know, we had to get Ryder reacquainted with with the, the deal. Right. So that took that out. So then we were planning to record in early 2020. Well, we got hit with the pandemic that ruined everything. So this pandemic get... you speak of, what is this? Yeah, yeah I don't know. Like, you'd think somebody would have mentioned this on TV. Yeah, it would have been nice. But anyway, that that basically took us to where we are today, where we finally got it done. My wife getting cancer made it even worse because any potential that I had to get together with the guys during the pandemic was was tempered by all the other shit that was going on. But we finally got it done and we got it delivered at the end of November. And now we're just getting the mastering done. It'll be sorted out like within a week here. We'll get it once the holidays are over here. And uh, when's it going to come out? Well, Relapse is telling me that the delay is the vinyl. The vinyl pressing plants are so full for two reasons. One is because vinyl is now pretty popular again. But the second reason is, is that every band under the sun has an album coming out. Because what have they been doing for two years? Yeah. Writing records. Yeah. So now we're gonna you're going to see a flood of new releases. But... The bad news is, is that everything's backed up because the plants can't uh, press the records fast enough. So it's going to be probably at least five more months before you see cycle, even though it's done. Um, so probably May. That's when. That's what they're telling me now. And hopefully there's no more delays on it. Maybe the, maybe we get another pressing yeah. plant increases their capacity or something. We May get... 2022. That's what we're aiming for right now. That's what they're saying. And by the cycle. way, cycle. Of contempt. This yeah. is not. I don't know if I could show it here. Cycle of yeah. contempt. That's not that's the cover. name. That's not yeah. the cover, but that's the name of it's the kick-ass image, though. Yeah. yeah well, look, at that. look at that. Guys are just. Look at that. Yeah, but there's a story behind that 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 leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Okay. Okay. So let's not show it then. Don't worry about that. It's important. It's actually important for me to say this because uh, uh, this needs a big audience to hear this. Okay. Because this guy, this, I, up, yeah. this guy tried to. This guy tried to shake me down. This this guy in China. What happened was, he offered to make the cover for us years ago, and he seemed like a nice guy at the time. And he's like, "Hey, I'll do a cover for you." And uh, you told me if you like it. No, I thought the whole time he was offering to do this, I was just going to pay him money for the cover, like I do every other time I do a cover. So I thought, well, we'll let him go down the road. And if he gives me something good, I'll, I'll buy it off him and we'll, we'll go from there. So he developed the cover for me based on my, what I told him was the concept. Okay. And he made the cover for me. So I said, great, I'll use it for the new album. I was going to use that. And then once I said that, he goes, I said, so tell me what you want for it. I figured he's going to ask me for what, you know, maybe, I don't know, whatever it's going to be. Anyway, so, um, you know, as long as he's not outrageous, I'll buy it off him. So then he goes, I don't want to sell it to you. I only want to trade it for worldwide rights to, to some albums. I'm like, well, I don't trade worldwide rights to records for artwork. I'm sorry. I buy <laughs> artwork and put it on the albums. He goes, well, that's the only way I'm going to do it. Otherwise, I don't want to do it. So Jeez. meanwhile, in, in, in the period of time that he had said that I had said I'm going to use the album cover, and the time that I was offering to pay him, there was a little bit of a window there. We weren't talking to each other every day. So there was about a month or two between these conversations. I told him I would use it. And he said, fantastic. He never told me about the, uh, the, the thing where he wanted the worldwide rights to anything. I made one big mistake. The mistake I made is I printed up 100 T-shirts with this image, which is what you're wearing right there, Jimmy. And he wrote me a nasty email telling me I was stealing from him because I use that image without paying it or without paying him or without giving him the worldwide rights. And I said, I made those shirts when we thought we had a deal. I assumed I'd be paying you for the artwork. I'm not printing any more of those shirts. I, I won't use that again. And he said, so, well, so that, my, by me wearing this, what's going on? Like, it's no, okay. It's you're, you're a it's thief. Fine. You're a it's filthy it's common it's thief. Yeah, don't try to go to China. <laughs> you're, you're in shit. No, anyway. So, I think so you I gave me this one. Is. I think, right. Dave, I think you gave me this one. Oh, it doesn't matter. You're fine. You're not in shit. You know, there was kidding. a guy in, in Hong Kong once who told me, don't trust China. China is asshole. Hey, you know what? So anyway, here's what else happened. Okay, so okay, go ahead. here's what he did. I didn't finish the shakedown yet. So then he goes, I need a thousand U.S. dollars uh, for, for you making those shirts. And I said, well, I'm not giving you a thousand. Goes, well, then you have to give me permission to make a hundred shirts and a hundred patches with this image. 
So like, here's the deal. Okay. I could have said, no, you're not getting nothing. You don't entitle to anything. I made a mistake on those shirts. If you, you know, if you want like a couple of bucks per shirt, I'd be willing to give that to you just to shut you up. But I didn't like um, what he said. So I said, uh, but not a thousand dollars for a hundred shirts. So anyway, um, I said that, no, I'm not going to, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So um, I said, but I will give you, I'll give you the permission to make a hundred patches, a hundred shirts just so you stop bugging me, but that's it. I don't want to hear about it again. And he wrote me back and he goes, don't worry, I'll just do a hundred. Well, I know I, I have my doubts. That's what he's doing. I think he's still selling it. Um, somebody, somebody sent me a link a little while ago. They still selling it. So my advice to anybody in the world, if you see this shirt now, um, I would recommend you don't buy it. Um, but I'm going to tell you the one you're wearing, Jimmy, that makes it different than the one he's got. You've got the band on the back of your shirt. Yeah, I do. I just don't We're want to turn around because I got oh. wires. I got yeah, wire. There you go. Got Can the, you see that? You've got the okay. So you've got the real one. You've got the one that's cool. Yeah. Anybody who's buying the shirt that doesn't have that on the back is buying the one that he's doing. I would recommend you don't. But you know what? It doesn't matter if you're wearing that Can shirt. That? It's totally cool. But I'm worried that I'm just I just hope this guy doesn't try something stupid like telling the world now when the album comes out because the cover the new cover is based on this design. Mm -hmm. It's not that design. It doesn't it, it it looks it's the similar concept, but it's completely different artist, completely different thing. Yeah, because and you're it, the one who came up with the concept. Oh, it's my concept, hundred yeah. percent. That's right. Uh, that's but right. you know, this guy, because he was being a weasel before, I wouldn't be surprised if he said, "Oh, you know, you took my concept." Like he just might try that, right? So yeah. I'm just saying, if he does, I'll publish his name and then we can all just tell him what yeah, it did. Yeah, we, we can hate him after, yeah. But yeah. right now, we'll just leave it as is. But by all means, if, I would wear that shirt because you're promoting Razor and I appreciate it. Okay. Like, I, yep. you know, now that I know the whole story, I don't think I want to wear it again. I want though. people to hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> I would put my traditional <laughs> Razor shirt on like uh, Razor yeah. Fist has there. But I will, right. yes. I, I wear it with pride. You gave it to me. I wear it with pride, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, you should yeah. wear it with pride. And anybody who owns one of those premen, you're, you're, you're cool in my books. Um, but the new the new album cover is going to be a, a similar cover. But uh, uh, honestly, it's better. It's better. You uh, know, I pay, just on a lot and a last note, and Razor Fist just there's a death fest we have in Montreal, and I think you're headlining it, right, Dave? Razor uh, was headline. It got postponed like two years. Yeah, already. yeah, he, yeah. He canceled it because of the pandemic. He's actually he's actually canceled now. He, he he couldn't he couldn't financially continue it. He had to he dropped a whole bunch of festivals. Yeah. All he kept was Maryland. It's pretty popular, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was, and we were on that bill, but uh, unfortunately, he had to cancel it. Yeah. So so Razor Fist, just so, so you know, there's a, a, a I wouldn't call it a major festival, but I call it a you know mid sized festival uh, with you know thrash bands, speed bands, death metal bands in Montreal that happens every year. So yes, I've heard of this. I yeah, have heard of this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, isn't it Quebec Death Fest? Isn't that what you're yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, Quebec Death yeah, Fest. Yeah, it's the Montreal. same guy who does the Maryland Death Fest, uh, Razor Fist. The same guy who does the Maryland Death Fest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really good guy. Really good guy. He's booked us for a bunch of stuff. He had us for Netherlands Death Fest and California Death Fest. I want to do California Death Fest again because the time we played it, we had some equipment technical issues and we didn't give them a full show. And I want to go back there and give them the right show. So I hope someday he puts us back on that California Death Fest. All right. Okay. Hey, I'd All like right. to be able to see you in California. I mean, California is like a, an hour by plane, six hours by car. I'd go. Hey, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Get to, I may be able to get to your area sometime anyway, my friend. I will. Uh, you will be my guest anytime you want to come to my show, of course. Right, right on. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. And on that note, let me just check yeah. one last time here. The telethon of stars. Here we go. Uh, nope, we're still... But you know what? I have to say there have been a lot of donations. It's been I nice. Feel, I feel like we've made a difference. I really you do. You make a and difference all the time. Not just today, but you guys both make a difference to me by helping me with my band, promoting my band. You are great friends of Razor, and I fucking appreciate you both. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we feel the same about you. At least I do. Razor Fist, yeah, I'm sure yeah, you do it's too. It's <laughs> the least we can do. I mean, you've, I, you've provided so much value as it is just with your career and your music and, you know, everything you guys stand for. Wait till you hear the next one. I'm telling you, you're going to like it. I'm telling you, you're going to like it. And right it's, gonna, it's, it's a beast, man. It's a fucking beast. I'm so this, proud of it. And if you don't like it. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. The show is dedicated like to Rose. Make sure she watches it. We, she will. Uh, you she know, we're all, was. we're all, you know, praying. Thank you. you know, it means a vibes. lot. Of and I'm sure everybody watching who joined today feel the same way. 
And, uh, you know, anyone, you can get... anyone who hasn't hit up the GoFundMe, shout it out. If you can share it, let everyone know what's going on because, um, you know, this is first off, it's a fantastic cause. Um, this is definitely a woman who has been through enough and at, at this point. And not only that, but just in a great way to support a great guy from a great band who have uh, provided a lot of value to a lot of people who dig their music and, and everything about them. So uh, I definitely, if you're a member of the Razor Force out there, check it out and uh, and help out if you possibly can. Or if, barring that, shout it out. Yeah, exactly. All That's of it. the positive messages that are coming to my wife, I want everybody to know who's sending those messages they mean a ton to her they lift her spirits she she gets emotional sometimes with them um because she's uh she's just so blown away by the level of support that we've gotten and the expressions of concern it it, it really helps and makes a big difference guys so thank you so much for for donating and thank you so much for sending the positive comments too yeah yeah guys it's been a pleasure we'll do it again and uh let's hope that uh, everything works out well I don't know what else to say, but thank you to the Metal Voice fans, too, for reaching out, donating. Yeah, in. Keep an eye on all of our channels, guys. Check all three of us out. And, um, you know, like I said, there'll be, you know, pretty soon there'll be a new Razor album to crank. And uh, believe me, it's not going to be the last one either. That's a promise. Two hours, man. We've been going for two hours. Look at that. Okay. Hey, well, we must like... Good company. Time flies. That's all I can say. It does. It does. <laughs> I, I was yeah. planning to be here for about half an hour. So We've corrected not... a couple of internet mistakes, or <laughs> right? Yeah. We've corrected some, some yeah. stories. The We've metal learned. Wikipedia trolls have been vanquished. <laughs> Honestly, though, that metal <laughs> mythos piece is, is a fantastic piece, though. So Go yeah. check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. Razor. Okay, guys. Okay. You have a good day. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.